of my friends. Well, some of you are my friends. And thank you so much for coming to join me on this Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. The countdown is in full effect, and there are six more days until the trial of Karen Reed. The jury will start being selected on Tuesday, April 16th, and this Friday, the motions in limine will be decided, and they started dropping like crazy today. And thank you to all of my amazing viewers who sent me so many of the documents that we're going to look at tonight. Um, and you know, there's nothing I like more than saying, I told you so. And I did, I did predict a lot of these motions in limine. So I love that. I love that. Uh, and you know, who knows, who knows what's going to happen from here, you guys. It's, um, it's wild. It's wild. Uh, there's also a letter that Josh Levy wrote to the judge, which we're going to look at tonight because, um, it's interesting. And I thought about this yesterday when she was making that ruling, like, you really think you can just disregard a federal court order, but, um, he's going to school her a little bit on the law and ask her in a very nice way to guide her actions accordingly. And we'll see what she does, but he had to get it in there. She, you know, he had to get it in there before she unsealed that stuff because she told poor Ms. McLaughlin to redact everything by 11 AM. So I don't know if they messengered it over there or they, you know, faxed it because a lot of these courthouses, you still have to use the fax machine or law firms anyway, um, or how it was uh, delivered to the judge. But we're going to take a look at that. There are a lot of motions in limine that have been filed. And as you know, we've discussed this before. A motion in limine is made prior to trial to either admit or exclude certain evidence that you want ruled on prior to trial. So obviously the defense is asking for certain things to be excluded that we had already talked about that we were predicting. And the, um, the Commonwealth is, is asking for some things to be included that we didn't know about. So we're going to get with it. I just want to see if there's anything in the list here that I do not have. So somebody may, if you have it, you can email. If one of the mods could put my email in the chat right now, I'll put it up on the screen. I'm just trying to see. I've got the bad act stuff. I've got the, there's one thing there that I did not have. What is it? Um, the sequestration order. Does anybody have that? It's document number 293. Let me put my, thank you, my little cupcake. There's my email. I'm looking for specifically a document number 293, which is the sequestration order. And there's a motion to allow in-court identification. That is number 294. And the one about the death certificate, 297. I don't think I have that one either. So if anybody has those and they want to shoot them over to me, we can go over those as well. We don't need to go over every single one of them in depth, but they are interesting. They are interesting. All right. Uh, where should we start? We're going to start with Aruba. We're going to Aruba, my friends. And we predicted this. Somebody asked in the comments last night. They wanted to know... Um, what happened in Aruba? So I linked the prior stream uh, that I did where we talked about the uh, Commonwealth's response that mentioned all the stuff that happened in Aruba. And for those of you who don't know, we're going to talk about it now. Thank you to Justin for getting in here with the Cash App even before the stream started. And look at that. Diane, thank you for gifting five memberships. You're amazing. Nancy Joe, thanks for becoming a member. Melissa. And Beth Hamelin, thank you for becoming members. You guys, we have a good time here. Dudley Do Right is on the detail, you guys. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dudley Do Right, for supporting me all day today with constant emailing. Every time something would drop, Dudley was on the case. On the case. Everybody wants a vacation. All right. What does it make you think of when I say Aruba? 
Any songs? You know how I think of song lyrics. Anyone? Anyone? I think it's a Beach Boys song, right? I think that's what we're thinking of. The first thing that we're going to go with, the, we're going to start with the defense because these are the first things that came to me today. So we're going to start there. One second. I need to share this a different way so that I can more easily. get to where I need to be. Let's see which format is going to work best for these documents because they're a little bit wonky. Um, all right, I'm happy you call me live too. Natalie Holloway, yes. A lot of people are reminded of Natalie Holloway. Aruba, Bahama, come on, pretty mama. That's it. That's it. You know what I'm talking about. You guys know. You guys know exactly what I'm saying. Brandy, hi, Brandy. Hi, Brandy. I was watching a little bit of the Chad Daybell trial with you this morning. And then I just, I just feel so bad because the Zoom feed is not great. It had nothing to do with you because uh, I looked all over. And luckily, I think in this trial, in the Karen Reed trial, there's going to be a real pool photographer in there instead of forcing people to watch the Zoom feed because that's what happened. In Lori Vallow, it was audio only. So at least we're getting some video and I hope we're going to get some good video and not like hearing that we had uh, was it yesterday already. Oh my goodness. I don't even know what day it is anymore, my friends. But here we are, and according to the screen on my laptop, it is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. And the first motion in limine today is called, it's a, a motion to exclude prior bad character and propensity evidence. And here we go. Let me know that my audio is okay because I was hearing like a hissing in my mic before I got on. And also StreamYard was having major issues today. Nobody could stream to YouTube from uh, StreamYard earlier in the day. A lot of, saw a lot of streamers that were supposed to go live tonight that canceled their streams. Uh, so it has been a day. A day. Audio is good. Good. All right. Here we go. The defense is asking the court to exclude any reference to the irrelevant, in inadmissible, and prejudicial events that purportedly transpired in Aruba on December 31st, 2021. That was New Year's Eve, 2021. Little less than one month prior to Officer John O'Keefe's death. As grounds for this motion, the defendant states that the proffered evidence constitutes inadmissible prior bad acts evidence and is not probative of any material issue in this case. Should the court find that this propensity evidence has any marginal relevance, any probative value of the proffered evidence is outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice. So we're going to see this a lot in these motions today. It's a concept that I just want to explain to you real fast, and that is whether or not the evidence that is offered is more prejudicial than it is probative. So the court has a little, a little weighing to do. And if the court decides that the evidence is more prejudicial to the defendant than it is in helping the jury make its decision with regard to the charges in the case, if it's more prejudicial, it gets excluded. If it's more probative, it tends to be included. So that is the test one of the tests. So this is what they're arguing in this case, that the, all the stuff that happened in Aruba is more prejudicial than probative, and they're going to tell us why. This is not a fly on your screen. This is my cursor, so don't freak out and break your television and then send me the bill. Okay. Should the court find that this propensity evidence has any marginal relevance, any probative value of the proffered evidence is outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice. And this factual background is going to be the same in every single motion, so I'm only going to read it the first time. Factual background. Ms. Reed is accused of the following crimes arising out of the death of Officer John O'Keefe. Murder in the second degree in violation of MGL section 265, section one, that's count one. Manslaughter while under the influence of alcohol in violation of MGL 
265 S 13 and a half. That is count number two. And leaving the scene of personal injury and death in violation of Massachusetts General Law 90, Section 242, A and a half, two, count three. I've never seen um, statutes with halves in them before. This is a first. This is Massachusetts, my friends. This is where we are. The defense suspects that the Commonwealth will seek to admit testimony regarding a completely irrelevant verbal argument between Ms. Reed and a woman named Marietta Sullivan, which occurred in Aruba on December 31st of 2021 for the sole purpose of trying to assassinate Ms. Reed's character in the eyes of the grand jury. Although every single witness unequivocally testified that there was no history of violence whatsoever in Ms. Reed's and O'Keefe's relationship during the course of the state, grand ju- the state grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth repeatedly elicited inadmissible testimony regarding an incident that occurred in Aruba one month prior, which had no logical relationship to the crime charged. And remember, this is the defense's argument. So tell me if you agree. I mean, when we get to the end of this motion, Tell me if you agree with the reasoning here and if you think that this Aruba stuff should be excluded. The Commonwealth has no reliable evidence to suggest that the Aruba incident had anything whatsoever to do with O'Keefe's death a full month later on January 29th, 2022, or that this remote and isolated incident was even a point of contention in Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe's relationship after that trip. During the course of the state grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth called numerous witnesses to testify about this highly inflammatory incident in which Ms. Reed apparently got angry at another woman, not the decedent, Officer John O'Keefe, because she purportedly mistakenly believed O'Keefe had kissed another girl. Thank you, Debbie, for the cash app. You're amazing. Love you guys. The Commonwealth intentionally admitted this prior bad acts and character evidence for no reason other than to sully Ms. Reed's character in the hopes that the jury would indict her based on the fact that she was, in Marietta's word, an a-hole. They spell it out for you in the court documents, but you know I don't like to do the cursey words because we try and keep it classy here. A set forth here in this evidence must be excluded. Argument. The Aruba incident constitutes inadmissible prior bad acts and character evidence, and any marginal relevance is outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice to the defendant. Motions in limine concerning the introduction or exclusion of purportedly relevant evidence are properly made and considered before and during trial in advance of the evidence being offered. The purpose of a motion in limine is to prevent irrelevant, inadmissible, or prejudicial matters from being admitted in evidence. And in granting such a motion, a judge has discretion similar to that which he has when deciding whether to admit or exclude evidence. Okay, so we've just learned the purpose of a motion of uh, a motion in limine, and we, we're not going to probably read that again because each of these motions is a separate motion for a separate issue for a separate piece of evidence or testimony. Quoting a case, it is a fundamental rule that the prosecution may not introduce evidence that a defendant previously has misbehaved, indictably or not for the purpose of showing his bad character or propensity to commit the crime charged. Although this type of evidence is sometimes admissible for other relevant purposes, such as to prove a common scheme, pattern of operation, absence of accident or mistake, identity, intent, or motive, these exceptions are not without limitation. Similarly, although evidence of a hostile relationship between a defendant and his spouse may be admitted, as relevant to a defendant's motive to kill the victim, such evidence should not be admitted if it relates to events which occurred at a time too remote from the killing. And then they cite a case that says, animosity between husband and wife three years before the murder was too distant to be probative of the husband's motive. And another case from 1959 that says, evidence of defendant's husband's adulterate relationship adulterous relationship which terminated seven months before the wife's death was not probative 
of motive to murder. Quote, temporal remoteness is not an exercise in line drawing. Rather, a reviewing court focuses on the logical relationship between the prior bad act evidence and the crime charged. Moreover, even when this type of evidence is relevant for some limited purpose, the evidence must be excluded if its probative value is outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice to the defendant. Uh, footnote number one, we don't need to look at right now. Here, testimony by Marietta Sullivan that Ms. Reed got angry at Marietta Sullivan, not the decedent, on December 31st of 2021 because she mistakenly believed Marietta had kissed her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, is simply not probative on the issue of whether Ms. Reed had an intent to murder John O'Keefe on January 29th, 2022. This event was remote in time and was clearly not an issue between O'Keefe and Ms. Reed on January 29th, 2022, as evidenced by video surveillance footage from the Waterfall Bar and Grill on the night in question and the testimony of eight witnesses, all of whom agreed the parties appeared happy and in good spirits. There is no logical relationship between the Aruba incident and the crime charged. I have to agree with that. The sole purpose of the Commonwealth's attempts to admit this evidence is to sully Ms. Reed's character by allowing Marietta Sullivan to testify that Ms. Reed is an a-hole. If we are to believe the Commonwealth's best evidence, i.e. that Ms. Reed said F you to Marietta when she temporarily and mistakenly believed that she observed Marietta kissing her boyfriend one month prior on New Year's Eve in Aruba, that evidence is simply not probative of a motive to murder O'Keefe more than a month later, when the parties were, by all accounts, in good spirits. In order for there to be a logical relationship between the, the prior bad acts, evidence, and the crime charged, as required by Commonwealth versus Peño, the jury would need to believe that Ms. Reed reacted with a verbal F.U. when she believed she had observed adulterous behavior on December 31st of 2021, but then subsequently flew into a murderous rage a month later when this event was remote in time and not the subject of any arguments on the night in question. That type of reasoning defies logic. You know what I would say there? I would say it strains credulity. Oh, there's also, uh, we could look, at, if we have time, there's a, an appellate brief that um, Mark Randazza filed on behalf of the uh, four uh, can Canton citizens or citizens of Norfolk County that wanted to... Um, intervene in the buffer zone issue. And uh, there is one sentence there where he says, I think he says, it strains belief. And all I could think of was, it strains credulity, it strains credulity. But I digress. The only reason for the admission of this evidence is to sully Ms. Reed's character and prejudice the jury against her. Ms. Reed asserts here that this inadmissible propensity evidence has no probative value regarding the crime for which she has been indicted. Regardless, even if the court finds that this evidence has some marginal relevance in terms of evidencing a hostile relationship or intent to murder, which the defense asserts it does not, Ms. Reed's verbal reaction in response to a temporary mistaken belief that O'Keefe kissed another girl one month prior is far outweighed by the prejudicial and inflammatory effect it will have on the jury. prong two of the argument. The Commonwealth must be prohibited from calling witnesses to testify to inadmissible hearsay for the purpose of admitting to attempting to show a hostile relationship. Okay, so not only during the state grand jury did they call Marietta Sullivan to testify about this alleged um, interaction. They called Officer John O'Keefe's brother, Paul, to the stand to testify about what people told him about that incident, as well as, I think, Marietta's sister to testify about what Marietta's sister told her. You following that? It's kind of like how, um, you know, people don't really know each other because her sister's brother's cousin's son was in somebody's wedding 20 years ago. Following me? It's like double hearsay. 
Moreover, Massachusetts courts have often long held, uh, sorry, Massachusetts courts have long held that the admission of hearsay statements for the purpose of showing a hostile relationship between the defendant and the victim is not permissible because it would entirely eviscerate the rule's important purpose of securing the correctness and completeness of testimony through cross-examination. Here, testimony by Paul O'Keefe and Laura Sullivan regarding the irrelevant and inherently prejudicial Aruba incident must be excluded because these witnesses have nothing to testify about other than inadmissible hearsay. Indeed, during the course of the state grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth knowingly chose to put O'Keefe's brother, Paul O'Keefe, on the stand to testify about the stories he'd heard from other people about an incident in Aruba on December 31st, 2021, involving Ms. Reed, O'Keefe, and a woman named Marietta Sullivan. And the date of that testimony was April 27th of 2022. Three months after Officer John O'Keefe's state of death. Notably, Massachusetts courts have long held that the admission of hearsay statements for the purpose of showing a hostile relationship between the defendant and the victim is not permissible because it would entirely eviscerate the important purpose of securing the correctness and completeness of testimony through cross-examination. In spite of this bright line rule, Paul O'Keefe was permitted to testify to gossip he'd heard from three separate individuals, including his wife, Erin O'Keefe, Laura Sullivan, and Marietta Sullivan about the Aruba incident. Quote, I had heard of an incident in Aruba where Karen had got off the elevator and saw my brother hugging Laura Sullivan's younger sister, Etta, who is probably 10 years younger than she is, who my brother has known for a long time. And Karen perceived that as they were kissing or making out, which was not accurate because I've actually had conversations with both Laura and Etta after the fact, and they said that wasn't the case at all. And I guess Karen made a big scene, you know, yelled at both of them. And I guess it just wasn't a pretty scene from what I understand. I had originally heard it from my wife who would communicate with Karen often. And then after the fact, through Laura Sullivan and Etta Sullivan. That testimony was given on April 27th as well. You know, what stands out to me there is that his wife was communicating with Karen often. Which indicates to me that his wife and Karen may have been friends. I don't know when this whole thing turned ugly, but apparently it did between the family and Karen. Back to the document. Paul O'Keefe has no personal knowledge regarding any of the events that transpired in Aruba. Thus, all testimony from Paul O'Keefe regarding the Aruba incident is inadmissible hearsay and must be excluded. During the state grand jury proceedings, the Commonwealth also called Laura Sullivan as a witness to testify about the same incident, which, like Paul O'Keefe, she did not personally observe or witness. Laura Sullivan testified on May 5th of 2022. Remember, the grand jury was in session on this case for 14 days. Inter alia, which means in Latin, among other things, there's our Latin lesson for the day, friends. You can use that in everyday conversation. Inter alia, Laura Sullivan was permitted to testify about her completely irrelevant negative initial impressions of Karen during the planning of the Aruba trip, i.e. that Karen told her she needed her own bathroom and her own space. I'm going to break from the document for a second. Thank you, Maureen Francis, for the cash app. Love you, girl. Every single time. So, 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 so generous. I got to say that of all the cases that I cover, the Karen Reed streamers that follow me are the most generous of people. You guys just are. It's just a fact. So she had a negative um, impression of her from jump because she said she needed her own bathroom. Okay. Um, it's my understanding, and this has been out there, so that Karen has Crohn's. And if anyone knows anyone who has Crohn's or suffers from Crohn's or with Crohn's, you know 
that they prefer to be near a bathroom and near and have their own bathroom. So I don't, you know, what is that? That's like a little dig in there. And in addition to Crohn's, she also has MS and she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. But, you know, this woman was permitted to testify that she had a negative initial impression of Karen when they were planning the aerobic trip because she wanted her own bathroom. And that her husband told her that he saw Karen and John at the pool in Aruba and Karen was giving John an earful because she wanted him to get out of the pool to get ready to go out and he just wanted to watch the game. Which in addition to being irrelevant also constitutes unreliable and in inadmissible hearsay. I mean, it's just like, really? She wanted him to get out of the pool and get ready, and he just wanted to watch the game. And that, my friends, apparently that argument is a motive for murder. Because it was certainly presented to the grand jury to get a conviction, and they had to think that there was some reason that Karen wanted to kill him, right? Since they did, great the charges. Two more. The Commonwealth then elicited additional inadmissible, inadmissible and prejudicial hearsay testimony from Laura, allowing her to testify that her sister Marietta told her a story about how Ms. Reed was an a-hole in Aruba because she ran into O'Keefe in the hotel lobby on New Year's Eve, where he kind of tripped and like fell and Marietta caught him and Marietta pushed him towards his room. And Marietta said at that point, Karen turned around and said, who the F is she? And O'Keefe said, that's Etta, Lauren's sister. And Karen looks right at my sister and she goes, F you. And my sister was like, well, nice to meet you too. F you too. So <laughs> she's testifying about what her sister told her. To prove the truth of the matter asserted, that's the definition of hearsay. Hearsay is evidence offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. The Commonwealth then elicited inadmissible and prejudicial. All right, let's start that one again. The Commonwealth then elicited inadmissible and prejudicial hearsay testimony from Laura that she spoke with John later that night, and he told her that Karen is crazy. The Commonwealth then elicited inadmissible hearsay testimony from Laura, stating that her sister Marietta denied ever kissing O'Keefe and that she would know if her sister was lying improperly vouching for her sister. And finally, after all of that, the Commonwealth then asked Laura to, to describe whether anything stuck out regarding Karen and John's relationship, permitting Laura to go on a long, irrelevant, and speculative diatribe about her perception of their relationship, which included her opinion that, quote, there was no compassion or affection or anything between the two of them, and that there was no spark and no connection end quote. Thus, all of Laura Sullivan's testimony regarding the Aruba trip constitutes prejudicial and inadmissible hearsay, which must be excluded. Conclusion. For the above reasons, Ms. Reed respectfully requests that this honorable court exclude any reference to the December 31, 2021 incident in Aruba. And that, my friends, it's the Aruba connection. So many of you were so confused, like, what happened in Aruba? What happened in Aruba? Let's go to the chat. Magnolia Gypsy, thank you for being a member for a month. My first and only membership one month. Yay. Thank you. I am honored that you chose to spend your monthly membership stipend with me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mike, Mantha, thanks for becoming a member. You know, when I first started this channel all the way back in July of 2023, my audience was about 92% women and 8% men. And people would say, well, that's because men don't really like true crime. But this is a case that has really brought men to YouTube. So um, thank you, Mike, for helping the, uh, the ratio over here. And now I think we're up to over 20% men. Scott McGinnis, thanks for coming in with the 10 spot. The CW has been on a mission to smear Karen Reed and paint her character in order to supply a false narrative as to her motive to unalive Officer O'Keefe. All a lie. Bogus. She did not run him down. 
remember initially they released reports to the media that there was actual video. There was actual ring camera footage. Karen hitting John with the car. Those stories, we looked at them. They're still out there on the internet. You can find them. Look for all the news stories from local Boston stations and even the Daily Mail in the UK from February 2nd of 2022. Investigators say they have video evidence of Ms. Reed striking Mr. of the accident with, with the car. It doesn't exist. Dallas born, Boston bred. Thank you for becoming a member. Scott McGinnis, thanks again for coming in with another five. Uh, oh my God, even if Karen was angry with J.O., she's going to run him down in front of two cops' houses, one full of party guests, and no one sees it? Come on now. Right, well, wouldn't they have seen it? Because according to their own witness statements, they were looking out the windows the whole entire time. So, I mean, it's strange. this whole thing strains credulity. And uh, look, the fact that we're getting this close to trial, it's just, you know, must see TV, must read documents. I'm here for it. Stephanie, thank you for gifting um, five memberships and for all your awesome emails and for being such a kind and huge supporter of the channel. Appreciate you so much. Wait. Double M double nine became a member. Thank you. And Jennifer gifted five memberships. Thank you, Jennifer. So, so generous. YouTube distributes them randomly. I have no, no um, say over who gets them. Just be participating in the chat. Have gift gifted memberships opened or something like that you have to opt in you have to opt in there's like three dots you click on it and then maybe you'll get one too and you can join us over here at cupcake nation bryce thank you so much for the um ten dollar super chat would you cover would of uh, would, would you cover a viewer's case a multi-billion dollar fraud case coming up this year we'll see um, we'll see. Email me. My email is um available on the channel page and the mods often put it in the I cover cases that I'm passionate about. So you'll notice I don't cover every single case. Like there are a lot of law tubers who cover five different cases a day. I just, I don't have the bandwidth for that mentally. Like I just, if I'm going to cover something, I want to know everything about it. I want my facts to be straight. And uh, so I'm selective in what I, uh, what I cover. But when I cover it, I think my viewers can agree that I cover it thoroughly. <laughs> um, thanks, bro. <laughs> thanks, Bryce, uh, for the... Second super chat. Appreciate your perspective as always. Thanks. I appreciate you, all of you, because without you watching me, I wouldn't have a channel. Shari, thank you for your $20 super chat. You are generous with your time, educating all of us, breaking down terminology, speaking facts. You are a channel unlike so many others. Thank you so much. Because one of the twits today told me that I better watch out, that I'm going to be sued for defamation. I better watch out. Twits or twittiots? What do you think we should call them? I don't know. They're probably watching now, but I love it when people opine about the law and they really know nothing about the law. It just cracks me up. Microdos, thank you so much for your amazing videos and your amazing work on this case and others and for your $10 super chat. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a abhorrent character assassination and an obscene violation of Karen's civil rights. Sickening. Oh, it gets some um, better or worse depending on your point of view. But, you know, look, if that's the only thing that they could bring into the state grand jury to show some sort of an alleged motive for why she would do this again, right on a cop's lawn in the snow with at least 13 people now that we know of in the house watching out the windows, but nobody saw the incident and all the people that left after never saw the body. Um, I guess, you know, grasping at straws comes to mind a little bit. I have questions. Thank you for your questions and for your 10 spot. Uh, that model of Lexus has auto braking when it detects an obstruction. The reason why that technology was engineered, has this been brought up? I believe that it has. And I believe that the car was tested and everything was working fine. Somebody uh, can correct me if I am wrong on that, but we're going to get into some of the, I don't know, is it in these motions? I get so confused day to day. But I think there may be something about the car in one of these motions. Wild child, thanks for becoming a member. Freedom speech, press assembly. <laughs> oh man, I love your uh, your uh, your name, and I wonder what you think about this whole buffer zone motion. Heidi, thanks for becoming a member, and also Desiree, thank you for becoming a member. So, let us go now. 
Am I going to cover what did somebody say here? The Commonwealth's motions. Yeah, I'm here for it. I don't know if I have all 31 of them, but the ones that I have that I pulled that I think are important, we're going to look at as well. Correct. Hi, Olivia. Olivia says, that's what I'm saying. If that's the worst possible character evidence the CW could get on a defendant, that's actually impressive. It kind of is. Yeah, too. And except for, you know, the testimony of um, two young children who said they fought a lot, you know, and when everything's relative, right? If you're a kid and people are fighting, what's your definition of a lot? All right. It might be different from an adult's definition of a lot. Hi, Tia. Thanks for your $5 super chat. How can the defense be expected to file their motions in limine if the DA hasn't even completed their discovery obligations? Well, it's over. Their time to do so is over. So that's why we're going to see next. And this is a good segue into the next motion to exclude the alleged hair. So let's uh, take a look at that. Now, remember, um, several people have been on, I don't even know, is it, is, are, are we calling court TV and law and crime mainstream media and news nation? Are we calling them mainstream media? Let's say there have been several talking heads who have been on mainstream media who have been very adamant about the fact that a human hair, not only was a human hair found on the bumper of the Lexus, but that it was in fact, Officer John O'Keefe's hair that was found embedded. I think embedded was even the word that they used in the bumper of Karen Reed's car. But <laughs> you're gonna see that that's never been shown or proven. And so here is the defense motion for sanctions and exclusion of that DNA evidence. And we've heard them arguing about that in court hearings recently where Mr. Lally, poor exasperated Mr. Lally, <sighs> said that even though they paid an expedition, even though they paid for Bodhi Labs to expedite the results of this alleged hair, they're still not going to have the results back in time for trial. So, and that's when the judge said to the defense, I will entertain a motion to exclude the DNA evidence. And that's what this is. So the defense is moving the court to sanction the Commonwealth based on its failure to comply with discovery orders by excluding any reference to the DNA testing by Bodhi Technology for the purported hair recovered from Ms. Reed's vehicle pursuant to MC, MRCP 14. As grounds for this motion, the defendant states that the Commonwealth has failed to timely comply with numerous discovery orders imposed by this court and has not produced the results of any DNA testing of the purported hair by Bodhi Technology, in spite of the impending trial date, which is currently set for April 16th, 2024, to allow the Commonwealth to introduce any findings by Bodhi Technology at this point would therefore unfairly prejudice the defendant by denying her the ability to make certain tactical decisions or have her own expert meaningfully evaluate any result. I mean, we're on the eve of trial here. You know, they're gonna hire, hire um, an expert to come in and contest this evidence that was never timely turned over. We knew this was going to happen. And then they cite from case, uh, some case law for their position. And one second. And then again, they restate the crimes that Ms. Reed is, is accused of. And then they tell us this. On January 29th of 2022, that is the date of, of Officer O'Keefe's date, uh, date of death, law enforcement seized Ms. Reed's vehicle and towed it to Canton PD's Sallyport garage, where it was held as evidence in connection with this case. On February 1st of 2022, the vehicle was photographed and processed by a criminalist with the Massachusetts State Police Lab, Maureen Hartnett. So that was four days later. According to Ms. Hartnett, 
and, quote, apparent hair, end quote, was purportedly recovered from the bumper of Ms. Reed's vehicle. Okay, I'm just going to stop here to point out that after Karen, Reeves, what Karen, Karen was released from the hospital, she drove, I think it's about 40 miles from Canton to Dighton in what the Commonwealth is calling a blizzard. And then that late afternoon, when Trooper Proctor went to Dighton to talk to Karen and tow the car back, it was then towed back another 40 miles in a blizzard. So despite all of that, this apparent hair was purportedly recovered from the bumper four days after it was towed back to Canton. Are you following me? And again, also understand that Canton PD at this point had lost jurisdiction of this case and it was under the jurisdiction of the Massachusetts State Police. So why was this vehicle towed back to Canton PD instead of one of the MSP garages that would have been much closer to Dighton and in fact on the way back to Canton. But again, I digress. More than a year later, on March 6, 2023, Maureen Hartnett examined the hair with a microscope and opined that based on a visual inspection of the hair, it appeared to be, quote, human. However, discovery produced by the Commonwealth revealed that Ms. Hartnett failed her proficiency test associated with this precise subject matter, i.e. identifying types of hair, less than one month prior to her examination of the apparent hair, in this case, on February 16th of 2023. Subsequently, on August 25th of 2023, the purported hair was submitted to the Massachusetts State Police Lab for DNA testing, and it was forensically determined that no human DNA was detected. Look, I even put a little red arrow here. For all those people who have been screaming that this was a human hair, look, no human DNA was detected. And that's according to the MSP State Police Lab, their own investigators. Apparently dissatisfied with those results, the Commonwealth then requested permission to send the hair to an independent lab, Bodhi Technology, to conduct destructive STR DNA testing on the hair. Ms. Reed thereafter requested that her own expert, MicroTrace, be permitted to forensically examine the hair to determine if it is human before any further destructive testing was conducted by the Commonwealth. On November 14th of 2023, the court denied Ms. Reed's request to have her own expert independently examine the hair and ordered that the Massachusetts State Police Lab send the hair directly to the Commonwealth's independent expert, Bodhi Technology, to determine first whether the item is a human hair and then is permitted to conduct STR and mDNA testing on the sample, which may consume and exhaust all the evidence. And for the receipt on that, look at docket number 164. Based on Mr. Lally's representation at the last court hearing, the Commonwealth apparently altogether ignored this court's order and authorized Bodhi Technology to proceed with exhaustive testing before forensically examining the hair to determine if it was human. To date, no reports have been produced by the Commonwealth regarding any of the analyses conducted by Bodhi Technology, DNA or otherwise. Based on the Commonwealth's continued failure to comply with its discovery obligations, the court invited the defense to file a motion to exclude reference to forensic testing of the hair by Bodhi Technology for her consideration. And again, they are going to go through in the first part of their argument is telling us what a motion in limine is. And the purpose of a motion in limine is to prevent irrelevant, inadmissible, or prejudicial matters from being admitted into evidence and in granting such a motion, a judge has discretion. And then they go on to say, in addition to the court's inherent authority to rule on evidentiary motions in advance of trial, Massachusetts RCP number 14 provides for sanctions and exclusionary remedies based on the Commonwealth's failure to comply with its discovery obligations. So just to uh, define another term for you in case you are not familiar, sanctions is like, think of it like a punishment. And it could be either money, oftentimes lawyers are sanctioned and they have to pay a fine, 
or excluding an evi evidence or dismissing an indictment. So a sanction is just basically like a, like a punishment. And it says here, the prosecution is to disclose to the, the, disclose to the defense and permit the defense to discover, inspect, and copy intended expert opinion evidence and all reports prepared by the expert pertaining to same. And they're saying, they never did that, judge. They never did it. You need to exclude this evidence. And in determining whether an exclusionary re remedy is appropriate, the court must consider, number one, the need to prevent surprise. Number two, the effectiveness of sanctions less severe than exclusion. Number three, evidence of bad faith. Number four, prejudice to the other party caused by the testimony. And number five, the materiality of the testimony to the outcome of the case. Here, the Commonwealth has repeatedly violated its mandatory discovery obligations and to date has failed to produce the results of the DNA testing and or examination of the purported hair found on Ms. Reed's vehicle by Bodhi Technology. The results of any forensic inspection and or DNA testing by Bodhi Technology remains unknown and at this point would constitute an unfair surprise to the defense. The trial is set to commence on April 16th, 2024, which is only one week away. Because of the delayed disclosure of significant material and relevant discovery in this case, and in spite of repeated defense objections, the court has made it clear that this trial will not be continued any further than April 16th of 2024. Absent the court's willingness to continue trial in this matter, Ms. Reed will undeniably be prejudiced by the delayed disclosure of yet another piece of critical evidence in this case, the results of any forensic examination and or DNA testing that has been completed in this matter by Bodhi Technology. There is simply no excuse for the Commonwealth's continued delays. The hair in question has been in law enforcement's custody and control for more than two years since January 29th of 2022. It would be exceedingly unfair to force Ms. Reed to make tactical decisions, including whether to expend funds hiring an expert to independently evaluate this evidence on the EVA trial, if the analysis is even completed by then, when the government has had more than two years to forensically examine this item of evidence, particularly when her own expert witness was denied the ability to forensically examine the evidence. It is severely prejudiced. It would severely prejudice uh, the defendant if you were to allow this. Therefore, please, please, please exclude this evidence, judge. Thank you so much. XOXO, Alan Jackson and friends. My guess is, well, I mean, she's already said in open court that she was going to exclude this. So there goes the hair. The hair is out. I also think that the Aruba stuff should not be allowed in because, well, first of all, here, none of that hearsay stuff should be allowed in. Um, but then you have just one witness, Marietta Sullivan, who's going to come in and say what? Karen said F you and, and, and said, who the F is this? And called her an a-hole. Like, in your opinion, my friends, does that give a motive for murder? And do you think that Marietta Sullivan's testimony should be included in the trial? I mean, what say you? Come into the chat. Nick Rocco, thanks for your super chat. Everyone needs to show up Friday. Knowing this judge, I wouldn't be surprised if she approves all the Commonwealth motions. We'll see. We'll get to those after we do the defense because I have them. I actually set it up tonight, like in an order. So I kind of got to go in order, but we'll see. Casey, thanks for your $5 super chat. Does the CW uh, need to, <laughs> every time I say the CW, it reminds me of the, the TV station, the network that Gossip Girl used to be on. Is it still the CW? I don't know. Uh, does the CW need to go back to law school 101 for bringing these witnesses to the grand jury to testify on hearsay? Well, there's not a lot of rules in the grand jury because it's a one-sided proceeding. It is only the prosecution that introduces evidence. There's no judge. There's no defendant. There's no defense attorneys. And uh, pretty much a free-for-all. 
In fact, there's a, um, uh oh, uh oh, I almost spilled. Uh, Saul Walkler, who was the chief judge in New York State, famously is quoted as saying, New York prosecutor could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. That's where that comes from. Give me one second because I'm about to have an epic fail with my. So there's that. But we went over that motion also to um, dismiss the indictments based on all of this crappy evidence that was presented to the grand jury and uh, that was denied. So there's that. Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Thank you for your super chat. Um, if this were your case before a reasonable judge, do you believe that it should be dismissed? It so here's, here's what happens as a matter of course in every criminal trial and every civil trial too. After the close of the prosecution's evidence, the defense in every case makes a motion to dismiss the case based upon the lack of evidence or the weight of the evidence. And it's rarely granted, but it can be. And then again, at the close of the entire case, the defense will again make a motion, you know, preserving everything for an appellate record. I don't know if in this case... She really wants the jury to dismiss it. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of maybe saving face trying to go on here. Um, and I think, especially with, you know, we saw Lally make that argument about the Bodhi Technologies DNA. Like he just wants it to get thrown out because he doesn't want to come back and say it's not a human hair. I mean, that's a tactical decision too, right? That's strategic. Nobody wants egg on their face, right? Hi, Shannon Elizabeth. Thank you for your super chat. How can the defense put in all their motions to exclude when the Commonwealth has not turned in all their evidence? Will the judge postpone until it is all in? I don't, did they file their certificate of compliance? Because if they didn't, they're not going to get, um, I think he did say though, that was the last thing that they were waiting for. So maybe he was waiting for this motion to be granted before filing it. I don't know. I mean, they have the basics of what they want excluded. So, I mean, the judge is not going to postpone the trial. She's just not. She's just not. She's made it very clear. Every which way but Sunday. Thanks, Scott. Um, again, Auntie Bev is a clear and present danger. Her actions Friday will reveal how deeply she's involved in this cover-up. Scary as heck. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, is she going to rule from the bench? Because the only thing in recent memory that I can recall that she's ruled from the bench on is that Boston Globe motion the other day. When is the last time she ruled from the bench on anything? Point it out to me if I'm wrong, but we went over a lot of hearings together. Uh, and she'll say, I reserve my decision. I'll have it out by the end of the day. And she's got it drafted and she has some, she signs it in the back and she files it. So is she going to, she's going to have to decide these from the bench because jury selection is starting on Tuesday. And it's Friday. I mean, lawyers never get a day off. They'll be working all weekend for sure. And if her, if her motions, if she doesn't decide on these motions, it's going to be a problem for the weekend about what to prioritize and what to work on for the attorneys on both sides. Caitlin says, uh, if that's a motive for a murder, then I would be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Oh, telling him, telling him, get out of the pool and stop watching the game. Get ready. Get ready for dinner. Stop watching the damn game. Let's go. We have a reservation. Chamrock, isn't it true that the lab put the DNA testing on pause because Lally never responded to the lab? That came up in prior hearings as well. You are correct. You uh, Everybody, let's hit the thumbs up while we're here. Helps the algorithm. Helps all the people out there that don't know a lot about this case that want to learn about it. So it does help the channel and helps get the word out. Next up, Courtney says, that's what I thought when Ann Taylor was complaining about missing her weekend plans over the survey. Yeah, lawyers, when you're on trial, you're working 24-7. There is no, there is no vacation. There is no vacation. She ruled from the bench on the motion to recuse herself. Oh, right. Didn't she? That's right. She did. 
And she, whoa, she was flustered. That is correct. Thank you, Anna. We did go over that one recently. I should have remembered that one. Jennifer says, all these arguments that supposedly make her a murderer are pretty common arguments in relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen anything that would, you know, like, let's say in the Brian Walsh case, you know, how to dispose of a 120 pound woman's body or, you know, what chemicals will disintegrate a body. We haven't seen anything like that. I mean, I think maybe that kind of stuff goes a little bit more to motive. This is not. We have that. Somebody said Josh Levy. We have his uh, his letter. We're going to take a look at that as well. Key, sit tight, sit tight, everyone. All right. The next thing we're going to look at is the third thing that I predicted uh, of three, and that is a motion to exclude the blood alcohol extrapolation evidence. And I think uh, the reasoning is sound here, and I don't think it can be admissible, but you tell me what you think. I am not a forensic expert by any means. I'm, I am just an attorney with 30 years experience in state and federal court, a trial lawyer. So in this motion, the defendant is asking the court to exclude evidence of a serum slash plasma ethanol concentration test performed by Good Samaritan Hospital at 9.08 a.m. on January 29th of 2022. By extension, Ms. Reed also moves to exclude the blood ethanol concentration conversion performed by the Massachusetts State Police, as well as the corresponding retrograde extrapolation analysis. Okay, I'm going to break for a second because we've been over this before. And I always found this curious. So the body is discovered. Officer John O'Keefe's body is discovered around 6.04 a.m. He is taken by ambulance or EMS, don't quote me, to Good Samaritan Hospital. And he is not pronounced dead until approximately 7.50 a.m. Correct. At some point, and I don't remember the exact timeline, Carrie Roberts is told to take Karen home. While Carrie Roberts is taking Karen home, there is a mysterious phone call to Canton PD saying, Karen Reed is suicidal. You need to get her into good Sam. Somebody calls Carrie Roberts and tells Carrie Roberts to take Karen back to the scene. And the scene that I'm referring to is 34 Fairview, because that is the scene where she is transported to Good Samaritan Hospital for this, what we would call in New York, and I forget what you guys call it. It's a rule something. We would call it a 5150 or a 72-hour hold if you're a danger to yourself or others. And so that's how she gets to the hospital. People say, I thought it was her dad. I don't have any evidence that it was her dad. I want to see the call logs from Canton PD. I want to know who called. Um, I think somebody said they overheard her talking to her dad, I think, and said, I want to kill myself. Allegedly. Allegedly. Um but who was it that called Canton PD to tell them to bring her to Good Sam? I don't know. Why would her dad call the Canton PD? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just pointing it out. Section 12. Thank you. Section 12 in Massachusetts. So that's what it, what it was. They brought her in on a Section 12. But she didn't get sectioned, I think, when she got there. But wasn't that the reason? Yeah, she did go home that day, right? So she didn't get section when she was admitted to the hospital. She went home that day, right? But that was the, those were the grounds for bringing her there or the alleged grounds. I don't know. I'm just pointing this out because we went over a lot of police reports and a lot of witness statements and it was all in there. It's all in the documents. I'm not making this up. Anyway, that's the story of how she got to be at the hospital. And here... 
So as grounds for this motion, Ms. Reed states that, as acknowledged by the MSP forensic scientist Nicholas Roberts, Mr. Roberts, I don't think he's any relation to Carrie Roberts, but I don't know. In his report, quote, the ethanol result used in the reports was provided by an external party. The testing to obtain the ethanol result was not performed at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory, and therefore the reports do not fall under the laboratory's scope of accreditation. Okay, so the MSP, the lead investigators, the investigating body of this entire investigation, after they took over jurisdiction because either Canton PD was conflicted out because one of the Alberts brothers was at the time with Canton PD, he was law enforcement, or because it was a fatality and MSP took over. But in any event, MSP is the body in charge of this investigation. Maybe body's not the best word. And their own expert says Because those results were provided by a third party, they do not meet MSP standards. I mean, it says it right there. Since the Commonwealth cannot establish that the blood test result was administered, that the blood test that was administered is reliable for the purposes of a criminal prosecution, the serum plasma ethanol concentration result and the corresponding blood ethanol conversion and retrograde extrapolation that flow from the initial result should be excluded as unreliable and not the product of reliable principle and methods. Factual background. On January 29th of 2022, around 8.41 a.m., Ms. Reed was admitted to Good Samaritan Medical Center as a result of the acute grief reaction she experienced after learning that her then-boyfriend, Officer John O'Keefe, had passed away. In addition to evaluating her, the hospital performed blood work and a urine drug test, which included tests for the presence of drugs and alcohol. Ms. Reed tested negative for any drugs for which the hospital screened. The hospital, however, recorded an alcohol level in Ms. Reed's blood of 93 mg slash DL. See attached portion of Good Samaritan Medical Center records. Uh, we will not see those records because under HIPAA, those are protected. Using the value from the test conducted by the hospital and without ever having applied for a warrant to, themse to themselves test Ms. Reed's blood, as would be the normal course in a prosecution involving any aggravated form of operating under the influence, Massachusetts State Police performed a conversion of the reported 93, now it says NG, but I think it's MG slash DL result to a blood ethanol concentration ranging from 0.078% to 0.083% based on three different conversion factors on May 4th of 2022. Using that conversion, Mr. Roberts then conducted a retrograde extrapolation on June 6th of 2022. In both reports, Mr. Roberts explicitly notes that the serum plasma ethanol concentration obtained from Good Samaritan Medical Center was not performed at the Mass State Police Crime Lab, and therefore this report does not fall under the lab's scope of accreditation. Moreover, in his report, Mr. Roberts uses a time interval of 8.5 hours with an additional two-hour allowance from the time of 12.45 a.m., the time of the alleged incident, in an attempt to account for the uncertainties associated with the drinking history of the subject Prior to the time interval, Mr. Roberts' calculations determined that Ms. Reed's BAC could have been between 0.13 and 0.29 at 12.45 a.m. on 1.29.22. This calculation assumes that the subject's BAC had peaked at or prior to the start of the time interval, indicating that the subject had consumed no ethanol half hour to an hour and a half prior to the time interval. Okay, anybody who knows anything about blood alcohol levels in the world of, uh, you know, what we call a DUI, but I guess you guys call it an OUI. The legal limit uh, in New York is 0.08. 
Karen Reed is, I don't know how much she weighs, but she looks, maybe she's tiny, small or 110, 120 pounds. At 0.29, I mean, she might be like dead. Like, I don't even know. But she certainly would not have appeared not at all intoxicated like all the witnesses said. And if they really can't nail down something a little firmer than between 0.13 and 0.29, that is a ridiculously large range. Ridiculously large. Yeah, it is crazy. H.I. or hi says, uh, Reed's blood is irrelevant. She was not stopped driving. Was she? No, they did not take the blood until 9 something a.m. She could have gone home and done shots. But what should have happened is that MSP, if they had suspected her of hitting John with her car and being intoxicated, would have gone bedside to do their own blood draw. Correct? This calculation was not even performed by MSP until May 4th of 2022 when they wanted to upgrade the charges. Do you see what's going on here? Now I got to find my spot again argument. Because both the initial serum plasma conversion report and the subsequent retrograde extrapolation analysis are based on a blood test about which the parties lack essential information, including testing procedures and types of testing, the blood test results should be excluded. Retrograde extrapolation is a mathematical calculation used to estimate a person's blood alcohol level at a particular point in time by working backwards from the time the blood alcohol test was taken taking into consideration rates of both absorption and excretion. The SJC, for those of you who don't know, that is the appellate court. That is what the appellate court in Massachusetts is called. The SJC has held that, generally speaking, retrograde extrapolation analysis meets the Daubert standard for admissibility, and that is the expert test for admissibility. Daubert-Lanigan. Breathalyzer test results are generally admissible without the need for retrograde extrapolation, without the need for expert testimony, when taken within a, quote, reasonable time defined by the SJC as three hours after operation of a vehicle. There is a narrow exception in the case that they are citing in which expert testimony is required where the Commonwealth is proceeding under an impaired ability theory as opposed to a per se theory, and a test that is administered outside of the three hour window, necessitating retrograde extrapolation, expert testimony is required. The SJC recently addressed the issue of a defendant's consent to a blood test and a prosecution for simple and aggravated forms of OUI in two companion cases. And the court held that the consent requirement only applies in prosecution for simple OUI rather than to any of the aggravated forms of OUI. Accordingly, whether Ms. Reed consented to the alcohol blood test or not is not at issue here. What is at issue, however, is that the parties lack essential information about how Good Samaritan Medical Center drew and tested Ms. Reed's blood. Oftentimes, in prosecutions for OUI and its aggravated forms, police will be granted a warrant to themselves test a defendant's blood through a certified analyst in line with the provisions of 501 CMR2 at SEC. While these requirements apply only to analysts working for the state police and not to hospital personnel, they ensure that blood testing for ethanol undergoes a standardized, reliable, repeatable procedure. The Mass State Police utilize gas chromatography testing rather than enzymatic immunoassay testing, which presumably was used by the hospital here. In the medical records provided under the, quote, chemistry section, there is an annotation regarding the drug testing, which states, quote, 
This report is intended for use in clinical monitoring and management of patients. It is not intended for use in employment-related drug testing or court-related proceedings. Samples are not routinely tested for adulteration and are assumed to be within the normal physiological pH range of 5 to 8. The alcohol result is beneath this annotation. It is not clear whether this annotation applies only to the urine drug screen or to the alcohol result as well. The defense should not have to guess. The Commonwealth should have provided documentation from the hospital regarding how the alcohol test result was obtained, through what procedure, by whom, and what manner of testing was used, i.e. gas chromatography or enzymatic testing, the latter of which would yield a higher result. Absent this information, the Commonwealth is unable to establish the reliability of this initial result. They go on to say that, therefore, this extrapolation analysis is not reliable. More precisely, the Commonwealth has not provided any information about the initial result from the hospital that would indicate that the subsequent analyses by the Mr. Roberts, by the Mr. Roberts, by Mr. Roberts are accurate. Accordingly, the serum plasma, conver plasma conversion and the retrograde extrapolation should be excluded. Should the court find that any issues with the initial blood draw and analyses by Mr. Roberts go to the weight of that evidence rather than its admissibility, the defense suggests that the Commonwealth will need testimony both about how the blood was drawn and what methodology was used by the hospital and expert testimony regarding the serum plasma conversion and subsequent retrograde extrapolation as Ms. Reed's blood was not drawn within a reasonable time after her operation of a vehicle as required by the case of Com v. Culturi. The defense requests of Wadir of any witnesses called from Good Samaritan Hospital and Mr. Roberts prior to the admission of any such evidence. And what that means is when they want to Wadir the witness, it means that they want to ask the witness questions about their experience and knowledge and whether or not they are able to testify as an expert witness. That is what it means to voir dire a witness. And we're going to go back to the chat because the chat is flying and you guys have so many questions. Hi, Tammy, Truth and Justice. Uh, ashamed to say I'm from Massachusetts. Thank you for your super chat. Uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. My pleasure. Gay Lynn, thank you for being a member for five months. Owen says if I'm if there's a motive for murder, then I would be in trouble. Did I already co cover these? Hi, Della. Thank you so much for the $20 super chat. I appreciate you so much. I can't always respond or give, but you are the most fair commentator, the most experienced who I trust. Thank you. Thank you. And please keep up the coverage for us for Seek Justice. What if it was you? You. It could be you. Karen Reed could be you. Karen Reed could be me. Karen Reed could be your sister. Karen Reed could be my sister, your daughter, your granddaughter. Karen Reed could be any, any one of us. Thank you, Della, for, for thanking me. Good citizen. Yes, we are going to cover this. Thank you for your super chat. They filed a motion on for leading questions concerning child witnesses. I will look at that. I have it up. Scott, thank you so much um, for the super chat. All these people were drinking the cops all day. Yeah, in fact, they were in New York City for the funeral of Officer Rivera, who was killed in the line of duty, NYPD, which prior to the most recent one that I covered for the officer who recently passed away, where we saw the sea of blue in Massapequa Park, Jonathan Diller, that is where Brian Albert and his cronies were in New York City all day at Officer Rivera's funeral on January 29th or January 28th. I'm sorry, January 28th of 2022. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for your super chat. Uh, Karen has Crohn's and MS. She cannot drink to that level. MS patients cannot drink much and her Crohn's would have made her very, very sick. Yeah. Yeah. I think I pointed that, pointed that out before too. I agree. 
I can't see who you are, but you have a very cute picture there. And thank you so much for your super sticker and super chat. See how mine, it just comes up as little boxes where your names are, where your name is. But um, thank you so much. If she truly has MS, there's no way she could drink a blood alcohol level that high and be able to function. I have MS and after three drinks, I can't. I thought so. Thank you for, for validating my opinion. Auntie Shell's Kitchen. Auntie Shell's Kitchen became a member. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Pat Sanford, in New York City for a funeral in the morning, drinking all night and having sexy time at 2.30 a.m. with your wife. Seems like a bit much for a man. Of... <laughs> you know, the butt dials. There's, there's just so much here that if you even tried to explain this case to a friend, you know, during a, a night out, it would take you three days. There's just so much here. And if you know, you know, right, Pat, you forgot the butt dial. Humor is always needed. None of your shit business is in the house. Yes. Anybody who can keep me laughing in the chat, like not like this is funny at all, but um, let's try and make this like a lighter place to be tonight. Because if you go to Twitter, you're going to be aggravated and angry and people are going to be throwing stuff at you. But here we just pass around cupcakes and, you know, try and keep it light. I just, I don't think the blood alcohol evidence should come in. That's been my opinion from jump and you guys know it. And the same thing with the Aruba stuff. It's more prejudicial than probative. I never thought that blood alcohol could come in. But, you know, she may say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to allow it. And then you can call your own expert to testify about why it shouldn't be relied on. But another expense. Right. Somebody said it's not even possible, Kaiser. It's not even possible to butt dial anymore. That could have worked in 2012. <laughs> Swifties too. Credulity is not their thing in Massachusetts. I don't know. I don't know. Should I slow the chat down a little bit, you guys? Is it going too fast? I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Let me just get in here for a second. Do, 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 do. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Put it on 30. Otherwise, I can't keep up with your comments. Okay. Tracy, blood alcohol result wasn't collected by chain of custody, so it should be thrown out. It should also be thrown out because by MSP's own standards, it was not an accredited place to draw her blood. If they were convinced that she was, I'm going to call it DUI because that's what we call it here, that she was DUI, they would have sent somebody in there to take her blood. They just would have. That's what they do, right? I know you guys, law enforcement in the chat. Initially, I can't wait to see the medical records to say what they initially were treating her as or what they were treating it as because I've heard some things that they may have been treating it as initially a DV incident not a car accident. So trust me, if they thought that she was DUI, they would have sent somebody in there to take her blood. And why did it take them until May to do all that extrapolation? Because she didn't take a plea and they wanted to upgrade the charges? I don't know, but it's sus and it should make you go, huh? Yes, paralegals. Thank you. Thank you. Experienced paralegals in the chat. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you, Scott. Retired NYPD, 25 years on the job. Yes, Mel, she would have been collared at the scene or the hospital. Correct. Especially if she showed up to the scene reeking of alcohol, yelling, I did it, I did it. You don't think they would have held her, g g made her blow into a breathalyzer? Yes, Olivia, exactly. Not if we think alike. Well, not only that, but they wouldn't wait months to actually do the BAC analysis. Right. Tamek, if they thought she was DUI, why did they let her drive away? She wasn't driving, actually. She wasn't driving. 
Oh, you mean why did they even let her leave the scene? Exactly. And then they they had to, they needed a reason to call her back. I don't know. Craig says, what was the reason for a blood test since she left first and there was no indication of a drunk driving incident? They did a blood panel as a result of somebody calling Canton PD and saying, uh, she's suicidal. You better get her in, section her under rule 12. So it was a blood panel that they did and they took the alcohol level, the ethanol level from the regular blood CBC or whatever they ran. And they're trying to extrapolate that into a drunk driving charge. It wasn't specifically tested for. It was just an incidental finding in the CBC. And they did a drug test as well. Michael Breen says, these are the same investigators that hold on to victims' clothing for weeks. Yep. I was surprised we didn't see anything about that today, about the clothing, or did it come in after? I've been reading and watching all day. Thanks, Della. Just because we all know evidence. These sick, thanks for exposing them all. I'm not exposing anybody. I'm just saying the evidence does not point to a car accident. That is what I'm saying. The injuries do not point to a car accident either. Next is what I will call the Aiden Carney exclusion motion. Defense wants to exclude all the irrelevant and prejudicial evidence regarding alleged witness harassment and or intimidation of witnesses. Last night on the stream, we went over the last minute exchange by the defense, uh, by the Commonwealth of the grand jury transcripts in Aiden Carney's criminal case, as well as the, what, what is it other than? It was a thumb drive and a whole bunch of other stuff. And they just turned it over. We don't have to read this whole entire motion. I'll summarize it for you. I mean, they just turned it over during one of the last days in March and one of the first days in April. Maybe they'll say it in the first paragraph. Obviously, the Commonwealth wants to introduce Aiden Carney's grand jury testimony or the witnesses that testified in the grand jury for his charges in Karen Reed's case. Okay. Like it has anything to do with it, but you tell me what you think. The defendant is asking to exclude any references to alleged harassment and or intimidation of witnesses by Aiden Carney, as also known as Turtle Boy, to those of you who have been following this case. As grounds for this motion, the defendant states that the proffered evidence is not probative of any material issue in this case. Should the court find that the evidence is relevant, any probative value of the evidence is substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice. Factual background. Oh, here it is. It was right here on the first page. On March 22nd, 2024 and February, April 3rd, 2024, the Commonwealth produced copies of the grand jury testimony in the, in the matter of Aidan Carney to defense counsel. There is significant overlap between the witnesses in this case and the cases that ultimately arose from the Carney grand jury. The witnesses in the Carney matters allege that they have been harassed by Mr. Carney during the course of his reporting on this case. As a product of his reporting on the Reed case, Mr. Carney has been indicted in this court for multiple counts of alleged intimidation of a witness in violation of Massachusetts General Law, Section 268. And in fact, he served, did he serve 90 days in jail or 60 days in jail? But rather than take a plea, he sat in jail because that's how much he believed that he did not do what they were accusing him of. And now they're trying to conflate that case with this case. 60 days. Somebody said 60. Somebody said 90. Sixty or ninety. It's one of those. 
They gave him 90 and he served sick little cupcake coming in with the info. Thank you. I love you. Um, so they gave him 60. I mean, they gave him 90 and he served 60. This is Jim Marson, Riders on the Storm. They had to put TB in their case because they have no evidence of a crime. But I think uh, Little Cupcake is right, right? They sentenced him to 90 and he served 60. He was let out after 60. Della, thank you again for the super chat. Imagine being falsely accused like Harry. My God. My God. Make it stop. It needs to stop. This needs to stop. <laughs> thank you. Turtle Boy says, just want to thank you for pronouncing my name, my last name correctly. Look, I'm Irish too. I'm Irish too. And, and they, um, I love how they use the word sully in the last, one of the last motions that we read like four times. And like the best place to use the word sully is in Boston because everybody has a friend named Sully, right? You are quite welcome, my friend, my dear. We're not friends. We've never even met, actually. But, you know, that's just what I call everyone on my channel. So don't get all the twits in a bunch. Here is their argument. The purpose of a motion in limine, again, is to prevent irrelevant, inadmissible, or prejudicial matters from being admitted in evidence. And in granting such a motion, a judge has discretion similar to that, which he has when deciding whether to admit or exclude evidence. The relevance threshold for the admission of uh, evidence is low. Evidence is generally relevant where A, it has any tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence, and B, the fact is of consequence in determining the action. Uh, it is sufficient if the evidence constitute a, constitutes a link in the chain of proof. Irrelevant evidence is not admissible. Then they go on to restate the charges and they say, in order to prove murder in the second degree, the Commonwealth must prove the following elements. One, that the defendant caused the death of the alleged victim. Two, the defendant A, intended to kill the alleged victim or B, intended to cause grievous bodily harm to the alleged victim or C, intended to do an act which in the circumstances known to the defendant, a reasonable person would have known created a plain and strong likelihood that death would result. In order to prove manslaughter while under the influence of alcohol, the Commonwealth must prove the elements of involuntary manslaughter. One, that the defendant caused the victim's death. Two, that the defendant intended the conduct that caused the victim's death. And three, that the defendant's conduct was wanton or reckless, plus the elements of OUI. That the defendant operated a motor vehicle on a public way while under the influence of intoxicating liquor or with a blood alcohol level of 0.08 or higher. The crime of leaving the scene of a fatal personal injury is codified in the general laws and it provides in pertinent part. Whoever operates a motor vehicle upon any way and without stopping and making known his name, residence, and the registration number of his motor vehicle goes away to avoid prosecution or evade apprehension after knowingly colliding with or otherwise causing injury to any person shall, if the injuries result in the death of a person, be punished. And that, coincidentally, <laughs> is what the person did <laughs> and back in 1994, the police report that we went over the other day. Clearly, the issue of whether Mr. Carney allegedly intimidated or harassed witnesses, which will ultimately be adjudicated by this court, is not an element of any of the crimes for which Ms. Reed has been indicted. Similarly, the fact that Mr. Carney did or did not intimidate any witness, per the meaning of the general laws, does not constitute a link in the chain of proof in relation to any element of any of the crimes for which Ms. Reed stands indicted. That issue is not probative of any fact of consequence in this action, does not bear on any element of any crime for which she is charged, and is not otherwise admissible.
as, for example, prior bad act evidence. And it says the nature of so-called prior bad act evidence is that it reflects badly on the character of the defendant. Ms. Reed is not indicted for any alleged conspiracy with Mr. Carney. The admission of evidence that Mr. Carney allegedly intimidated a witnesses in the Reed case would serve no legitimate purpose. It would only taint Ms. Reed with alleged actions by Mr. Carney that have yet to be adjudicated one way or the other. Both Ms. Reed and Mr. Carney deserve a full and fair adjudication of the crimes for which they actually stand indicted before this court, separate and apart from one another. For this reasons, all of that evidence should be excluded. Prong two of the argument. Should the court find that the proffered testimony is relevant, it should still be excluded as any probative value would be substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice to Ms. Reed and would tend to confuse the issues before the jury. Again, like I said, conflating the two cases. And again, they talk about how Evidence is allowed to be excluded when the probative value of the evidence is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. Though Ms. Reed reasserts here that this evidence has no probative value regarding the crimes for which she has been indicted, should the court nevertheless find that it is relevant, any probative value is still substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice to Ms. Reed were this evidence to be admitted at trial. As noted above, the proffered evidence does not go to any central issue in the case. It does not state of mind. It is not state of mind evidence. It is not consciousness of guilt evidence because the alleged incidents were not perpetrated by Ms. Reed. And for the same reasons, it is not prior bad act evidence. Nevertheless, should the court find that the proffered evidence has some scintilla of probative value such that it is deemed relevant, any probative value that does exist is substantially outweighed by prejudice, confuses the actual issues. To reiterate, the fact that Mr. Carney did or did not allegedly intimidate witnesses related to this matter is not of any consequence in this action, does not bear on any element of any crime from which Ms. Reed has been indicted, and is not relevant. And there's the conclusion, and that's why, Judge, you should exclude all of that. All of that evidence. What say you? Miku says, facts, though. Hi there, Miku. Haven't seen you in a while. How you been? Okay. Audrey, thanks. Uh, thanks for your super chat. You can skip going over the Aiden Carney defense motion explanation because the Commonwealth also filed the same exact thing. Okay, well, we're then we just won't go over the Commonwealth's portion of it because we just did it. They filed the same thing saying that they want it excluded. Well, we'll get to that. But thank you so much for your super chat. And Virginia, thanks for your super sticker. And Teresa, thanks for becoming a member. And Della, thank you, <laughs> Della, for your super sticker. The super chat. And Melanie is the next prosecutor on SVU. Yep, I see it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you, Donahue. Always a great show. Very educational and full of facts. Thank you for keeping us all updated and well-informed. Thank you. Thank you. Jojo says, I'm scared for Karen. The CW wants to take away all of her proof of innocence. Moving on. Uh, the, the defense is also asking for the jury to be allowed to do site visits. And we've seen this in a lot of cases where the jury is bused to the scene of the crime or to places that are going to be mentioned in the trial. We saw this in Murdoch where the jury took a field trip to Moselle and uh, <laughs> that was part of the problem in, in Miss Becky's. Um, the things that Miss Becky did that may be unscrupulous, but uh, we also saw it in the Adam Montgomery trial. The jury went on a field trip on day one and they went and drove by all of the places that we're going to be mentioned in Adam Montgomery's trial that was out of New Hampshire. But um, defense wants them to be able to go visit. Oops. Well, we just lost the first page. Oh, here it is. Defense wants the jury to be able to view the crime scene and the route thereto, in addition to the waterfall. 
Waterfall Bar and Grill at 643 Washington, Washington Street in Canton, Massachusetts. There's a plug for the waterfall. If you're in town, you should probably go grab a bite there. Uh, the route from the Waterfall Bar and Grill to 34 Fairview Road in Canton and 34 Fairview Road in Canton. And she, uh, Ms. Reed is also asking that she is permitted to attend the, the site view as well. Uh, it says that uh, it's very common that the court may, upon motion, allow the jury to um, go on a field trip or a site view. And you should allow it because in this case, it's going to help them make their decision, especially with respect to the 34 Fairview residence and its lawn, which appears more expansive in photos than in person. They also want to know, or they also want the jury to see the curve of the road because it's going to help them in assessing whether the accident reconstruction analysis performed by the Commonwealth is feasible given the curve of the road outside of the residence. Uh, and it says, during a view, the essential features of the crime scene may be pointed out by counsel, it being permissible merely to point out to the jury marks, matters, and things, but not otherwise speak to the jury. And you'll see that the Commonwealth is also going to ask for a site view as well. So it looks like that will be granted, but the Commonwealth asked for something else in their site view motion. So we're going to get to that. Here's an interesting motion. Okay, so now we're, we're flipping over to the Commonwealth side. Commonwealth is asking to be able to offer evidence. So not only is the motion in limine used to ask to exclude evidence, it's also asked to get a, an advance ruling on whether they can offer this evidence at trial. So the Commonwealth wants to offer evidence that Karen Reed was in custody for a period of time. And I found this a little bit curious. So I'd like some feedback on this from my peeps in the chat who know Massachusetts law-wise why the fact that she was in custody for a period of time would may not be admissible. But in this motion, the Commonwealth is saying that during the course of the investigation, the defendant was placed under arrest and transported to the MSP Milton barracks where she made certain unsolicited statements that were recorded on department issued body worn cameras. So they want to be able to play the body cam footage from the officers that transported her to MSP Milton barracks. They don't say when this was, Olivia, if you're still here. Was this after, was this when she was first arrested around February 2nd of 2022? Or was this at some other time? Right. All of a sudden, state police have body cams, but not during the friends and family meeting. No, they don't even have a pen. They certainly don't have a dictaphone. So they are saying here, that during the time where she was transported to M MSP Milton Barracks, she made certain unsolicited statements that were recorded on department-issued body-worn cameras. The Commonwealth seeks to elicit testimony in its case in chief that the defendant was at some point in custody during the time when she was observed by officers and made certain statements when they upped the charges. Yeah, so was this like after she was indicted by the grand jury, like around June? Interesting. Yeah, she was arrested twice. Right. So was this the second time? Because the second time, was she living with her parents in Dighton? And would that be why they brought her to Milton? I don't know. You guys know the area better than I do. And I'm not pulling up a map right now. So you... Hmm. All right. Maybe we'll find it. Maybe we'll find out. 
At some point, they probably never read Miranda rights. Yeah, for as well, I think that maybe they would have brought that up by now. But I, I, I mean, I'm sure it was not a confession. I don't know what statements she made, but I guess we're going to find out if it's uh, allowed to be admitted. Uh, the fact that the defendant was in custody during this time is inextricably intertwined with the description of the events surrounding the commission of the crime and thus is highly relevant. Anybody know? Anybody know what this body cam footage um, shows? Yeah, an excited utterance is admissible with or without Miranda. I don't know about that in Massachusetts, but excited utterances are typically an exception. Um, and I don't know what it was that she said or allegedly said. I don't know. But if it's on body cam footage, then obviously she said it, but I just don't know what it was. Or when it was, because they're not saying when it was either. So that is where I am curious. All right, so they want that. They want that allowed in. Never heard this before. Yeah, this is new, right, Kim? This is new information. Never heard this before. Oh, okay. KPT says the first statement she made was a witness, not in custody, right? So at the scene and where they're saying, allegedly, that it was overheard that she said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. Courtney says, wicked vague. Okay, Gareth says, Milton, not even close to Dyton. I don't know. It's not my area. That's why I'm asking news. That's why I'm asking news, guys. Where's Milton? Is Milton near Canton? I don't know. She probably hurt their feelings, says Christy. All right. Comment. Comment of the, that is the comment of this motion. I'm putting it up there. She probably hurt their feelings. Milton is the closest barracks to Canton. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Spicoli. Jeff Spicoli. That was a great movie, wasn't it? Fast times at Ridgemont High. What was the teacher's name? Mr. Hand. Mr. Hand. Or did any orders the pizza in class? Yeah, I remember that. That was a great, that's a good reference. Okay. So they want that. They want that. It's highly relevant because it's inexplicably intertwined because she was in custody and she said something about the crime and they want to show the body cam footage. And please, please, please let us. It's right next to Ken. All right. Thank you, sweet woman. That was very sweet of you. Or they ask for a limiting instruction. It'll be interesting to see if um, defense opposes that. We're going to see on Friday. Milton Borders Canton. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. Dudley Too Right, who has come to my rescue today, saved me from the train tracks. Milton and Canton share a border. She sat in the cruiser at the scene to warm up, right? But they didn't transport her to the Milton barracks from the scene. Stuff, right? Scott says, Mel, don't they have to turn over the body cam during discovery? Yeah, they probably did uh, turn it over. And now um, they want to make sure that it's going to be admissible before the trial starts. Okay. All righty. Well, that's one. Next, they would like that the defense counsel be instructed that they are not allowed to say certain things in their opening statement. Because, you know, they don't really know how to practice law or anything. Thanks, Buzzing for Truth, for your super chat. The MSP Barracks is on the Canton-Milton line. Okay, so it was close. When did they turn it over? I don't know. That's a good question. Boxer Brief. Why didn't they admit this two years ago? Bev, better not rule favor of no 30-party culprit, no federal investigation info, or no defense expert testify scientific evidence if she does KR will sue. I don't know when they turned it over. But they want a limiting instruction on opening statements, and they do not want defense counsel to be able to say things that, in their opinion, they should not be allowed to say. They're saying we want the court to instruct defense counsel to, con to confine their opening statement to the established bounds of Rule 24. The proper function in an opening is to outline in a general way the nature of the case which counsel expects to be able to prove or support by evidence. He should not be allowed to state facts which are irrelevant or for any reason plainly incompetent. 
That is citing a case. That is not Lally's words. Those are not Lally's words. He should not be allowed to state facts which are irrelevant or for any reason plainly incompetent. An opening statement has a narrow purpose and scope. It is to state what evidence will be presented to make it easier for the jurors to understand what is to follow and to relate parts of the evidence and testimony to the whole. It is not an occasion for argument. To make statements which will, will not or cannot be supported by proof is, if it relates to significant elements of the case, professional misconduct. Oh. <laughs> Are they warning the defense? Uh, you're going to be brought up on ethics violations if you say anything uh, that you can't prove by by the proof. Uh, I'm pretty sure they know what they have to prove and what they're allowed to say in an opening statement. But, you know, color me crazy. Moreover, it's fundamentally unfair to an imposing party to allow an attorney with the standing and prestige inherent in being an officer of the court or, or one who has the privilege of being admitted pro hoc vice before this Massachusetts court. That was, those are my words. I broke from the document for a second. Uh, to present to the jury statements not susceptible of proof, but intend to influence the jury in reaching a verdict. Moreover, the Commonwealth... Oh, it's going to make me crazy. Hold on one second. Uh, would not have had any opportunity to object... The Commonwealth moves for a ruling on the admissibility of any proposed evidence. Did I skip a page? Wait. No, I didn't. Oh, no, yeah. We're on visual aids now. Hold on. I went, took us to the wrong. All right. This is custody. This is oh, visual aids. I don't know if I just zetted myself out of that document, but they don't want the defense to be able to say any things in their opening that they're not going to be able to back up with evidence, basically. They don't want them saying things like, John O'Keefe was murdered by so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and they did this and they did that, and this is what happened, and this is how he died, unless they have evidence to back that up. And that is, you know, proper for an opening statement. An opening statement, you have to, you know, is basically the evidence will show blank, 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 blank. And the evidence will show blank, 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 blank. And further, the evidence will show, I mean, you wouldn't write it that poorly, but that's essentially what an opening statement is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking on my phone, but <clears throat> Didi says, Opening statement, quote, you will find that the chain of custody for the taillight is non-existent, end quote. Right. Uh, this next motion in limine is, all right, that's the custody one. This is by the Commonwealth regarding, oh, here it is, opening statements. And notice of visual aids, because I didn't, I didn't, all right, that's why I got confused. So in addition to not being able to say things in their opening that they will not be able to prove with evidence, uh, it says here to make statements which will not or cannot be supported by proof is if it relates to significant elements of the case, professional misconduct. Moreover, it's fundamentally unfair to an opposing party to an allow an attorney, blah, blah, blah. We read that already. Moreover, the Commonwealth moves for an order to require that the defendant identify in advance any visual aids, potential exhibits, or potential chalks the defendant intends to use during opening statement. Listen, we call them trial exhibits here. I don't know what a chalk is, but I think it's one of those big poster board exhibits because I remember during one of the hearings when um, Ms. Little, no relation, held up pictures of... Um, Officer O'Keefe's arm that the judge was saying, put that chalk down, put that chalk down. So they want the defense to identify in advance whatever exhibits or that they're going to use during their opening because nothing will have been admitted into evidence and the Commonwealth would not have had an opportunity to object. The Commonwealth moves for a ruling on the admissibility of any proposed evidence. And I, I agree with that. They should, uh, that should be granted. Next, here's the Commonwealth motion in limine regarding the use of leading questions. Somebody brought this up before. 
Now comes the Commonwealth and respectfully requests of this honorable court that if necessary, the Commonwealth be allowed to use leading questions of the child witnesses, KF, age 16, and PF, age 13. Okay, so this is the niece and nephew of John O'Keefe. whom he had adopted and had been raising tragically since his sister passed away uh, eight years prior to that. And, and then I believe her husband passed away very shortly within months of his sister passing away. And he took these children and became their guardian and they had, he had been raising them for eight years. These are the, the child witnesses that they're talking about. Um, and, you know, they're 16 and 13. They're not eight and six. So when they say, you know, they're of tender years, we're going to need to, but 16 and 13, I, anybody who has teenagers know that they could get up on the stand and be able to ask a, answer a direct question without having to be led. So I don't know that this is going to fly, but here's what they say. Evidence may be elicited by leading questions when the witness is a child. And this is the example that they cite. Put earmuffs on if you have a child in the room. No abuse of discretion when trial judge allowed prosecutor to ask minor victim a question, which is assumed but not decided, leading by asking, quote, did he place one of his body parts inside you, end quote. I'm going to break for a, wi a minute to say that, yes, in SA type cases where the child is a victim and the child has to testify and it is very difficult because of the traumatic experience that they went through because they're testifying against their perpetrator. Okay, I could see that. These children are apparently going to testify about whether or not John and Karen were fighting in the month leading up to. John's death. So, you know, I mean, tell me what you think about that example. I'm a little even just horrified that they would put that in there, but you know, that's just me, my virgin ears and all. Um, then they say there are, the next case is the prosecutor's use of leading questions to a four-year-old was upheld. The use of leading questions for child witnesses dates to the 1800s. Okay. The court have no doubt it is within the discretion of a judge at trial under particular circumstances to permit a leading question to be put to one's own witness as where the witness is a child of tender years whose attention can be called to the matter required only by appointed or leading question. See, I don't think 16 and 13 qualifies, number one, as tender years, and number two, that they would need a leading question to pay attention. So I'm not sure about that. And that's what they want. They want the leeway. Next, they also want a view of the scene. So they want to they want the jury to be allowed to go to 34 Fairview, the front exterior, the driveway, the front yard, including the area of the flagpole and the public water hydrant, the public roadway of 34 Fairview to the intersection with Cedar Crest Road, which I believe is the route that Karen took when she was going there or the route that she took when she was leaving there, actually. You can correct me in the chat. I appreciate when you do. They also want to see the interior and exterior of Karen's car, the 2021 Lexus SUV. Then they say the Commonwealth intends to have the Massachusetts State Police tow this vehicle to the public roadway in front of 34 Fairview Road in Canton. I have problems with this because the Lexus is not in the same condition it was immediately after the alleged accident. We've seen photos and the entire housing of the taillight has been removed. So my argument would be that it's not a fair and accurate representation of the way the evidence, this is the murder weapon, by the way. It's not a fair and accurate representation of the way the murder weapon existed on the date of the alleged murder, right? And I'm sure... The defense team does not need my <laughs> help 
in making their arguments on that. Commonwealth says the taking of a view is a matter within the discretion of the trial judge and the right to order a view in furtherance of justice extends to places without as well as within the county where the crime is alleged to have been committed. And we already know that because we read that in the other papers. Why does it keep changing? He also says, moreover, given the substantial interest in this case, the Commonwealth respectfully requests an order of this court to temporarily close the relative portions of Fairview Road to enable the jury to view the evidence and roadway without outside influence. The Commonwealth further requests a police escort to the view and use of Canton police officers and our mass state police to escort the jury and close the roadway. Is he going to ask for a buffer zone around the site view? Is he going to ask for the site for the road to be blocked off within 200 feet of the house? But I mean, everyone's going to know when this site view is happening, right? Because the trial is going to be televised. In the Adam Montgomery case in New Hampshire, the site view happened on day one of trial. We expected opening statements to happen. And instead, they sent the jury on the bus to go on the site view because they were working on a plea deal on some of the charges. So, I mean, it's announced in open court. People know when this is going to be. I'm just, uh, I'm just like curious about that. Okay. Uh, then we're going to get into the motion in limine to admit the 911 call, but let's just uh, go to the chat for a second. Oh, we've been here two hours. Wow, that was really fast, wasn't it, you guys? That was super fast. Everyone wants a cupcake. Suzanne, thank you again for your super chat. And Suzanne says, you will find that John was never hit by a motor vehicle per the FBI. Yes, per the FBI's hired accident reconstructionist with three PhDs who said John O'Keefe was not hit by a car and a car did not hit John O'Keefe. <laughs> Teresa Allen, thank you for your super chat. Uh, and she says, new member, thank you for the 20 bucks. Thanks for making this craziness make sense. Love your opinions and humor. Thank you. I try. And try to be entertaining as well. So thank you. Uh, Suzanne, the kids were questioned months afterwards. Thank you for your super chat. After Jen McCabe had brainwashed them, in my opinion. Everything here is in my opinion and the opinions of my viewers. None of my viewers' opinions are mine. None of my opinions can be attributed to my viewers. So, uh, you know, that'll be the next thing. I need a quick break. So what we are going to do right now is we are going to hear a word from our sponsor. We have a sponsor for today's video. And I just want to, before I uh, show you a word from our sponsor, I would like uh, to tell you about, if you don't know, if you are an AT&T customer or you ever have been an AT&T customer for your cell phone service, um, it was announced last week. Remember when AT&T service went down for like two days and nobody could make a call or go on the internet and people were freaking out because they were losing business and stuff. And then AT&T came out and said, hey, we're just doing a software update real sorry. Here's $5 credit on your bill. Well, the other day they announced that in fact, the social security numbers of 74 million AT&T customers, both present and past, going back before 2019, have been released to the dark web. So my friends, with this, I bring you my sponsor who quite possibly may be able to help you in a situation such as this. Did you know that the odds of falling victim to online crime are one in four? Online crime is soaring. It's time to get smart about online safety. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. 
Aura provides everything you need to protect your privacy, identity, finances, and your family in one easy to use app. Do you even realize how much of your personal information is already out there being sold by data brokers to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you? Well, if you Google yourself, you may find something like this. And it may shock you to know that your full name, home address, email address, health records, and even relatives, it's all out there. That's one of the reasons you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does cleaning up this information reduce the amount of spam that you get, but it will protect you from hackers who could use the information to help them access your social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also helps protect me and my family from online threats by providing antivirus and malware protection, a secure VPN with military-grade encryption, credit monitoring, spam call protection, parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. With the family plan, Aura will help you protect your kids by blocking harmful content, managing how much time they can spend online, and providing you with peace of mind while they game with cyberbullying and online predator threat alerts. I value my privacy and my online safety, and I value yours too. So go to Aura.com slash Melanie Little to start your two-week free trial because you can't put a price on peace of mind. I've also put the link in the video description below. You can thank me later. You can thank me later. Free two-week trial. Find out if your stuff is on the dark web because uh, that's scary. If you've ever had your identity stolen or know anybody who has, um, it takes a really long time to correct that. And uh, it starts at 12 bucks a month and you get a VPN and all that other stuff. So listen, I use it. I think it's great. Take that for what you will. But you have to use my link to get the two-week trial. Um, I'm going to just address some Venmos, which are amazing because, as you know, YouTube takes 30% of Super Chats. So, Michelle, thank you so much for your Venmo. Michelle says, your explanations are so helpful. If the state never files its certificate of compliance, does the case automatically get dismissed? Does this ever happen? I don't think it would happen. If they never file their certificate of, of, of compliance, they're never going to get their reciprocal discovery. So it's in their best interest to do that. I don't know why they're waiting so long, but um, apparently it was because Bodhi Labs didn't get their stuff done in time. And I think they kind of want that stuff dismissed so they don't have to admit that it wasn't human hair. Mary Jo, thank you so much for your Venmo. Mary Jo says, thanks so much for all you do, especially with the Karen Reed case. Appreciate you break everything down and explain it all. Thank you guys for watching because without you guys, I don't have a show. Emmy, thank you so much with the cupcake emoji. I appreciate you so much, Emmy, as well. And Sharon says, making it easier to unscramble all these motions. 67 <laughs> scratch in my head. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you. There's a Karen in here. Thank you so much, Karen. Says, awesome Karen Reed coverage. And there's a Mike in here as well. Says, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you guys are insane. Nancy Kelly, um, sorry, Nancy. <laughs> Nancy says, thanks, love your shows. Um, Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you for your countless hours of coverage of Karen's trial. We appreciate you and your time. Oh, Melissa, the trial hasn't even started yet. You just wait, buckle up, girl. And Suzanne, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you for your, all your timely, great analysis and work on the Karen Reed case. You're the best. If you ever get up this way, I'll make you a dozen cupcakes. Thank you, Susie. I appreciate that. And also Kimberly. Kimberly, thank you so much with the cupcake emoji. You guys are really, really, really amazing. You really are. My Boston friends, I might, I mean, it's not like I'm going to start rooting for the Bruins or anything because you know I'm a hockey fan and I'm a Ranger fan and we're getting into playoffs, you guys. I told you I'd help you root for the Bruins until we got to playoffs. So, um, <laughs> but I will try and be, you know, cognizant of the hockey schedule. Um, Rangers Islanders last night, not a great game, but we're in the playoffs. So we got that going for us. All right. Back to these motions in limine. Now this one is by the Commonwealth to admit the 911 call. You may know 
we've never heard the official 911 call. The call that we have we have heard is the call that was recorded on John's phone when Karen dropped the phone in the back seat of Carrie, Carrie Roberts, um, I think it was Carrie's car that they were in. When they went back to the scene and Karen saw John's body, she was on the phone leaving a voicemail for John. She dropped the phone in the back seat of the car and the car picked up what happened in the car when she got out, her screaming bloody murder. Um, we heard Jen McCabe say to 911, there's a man passed out in the snow. There's a man passed out in the snow. Very calmly. Didn't say, holy F, there's a B Boston police officer down. Hurry, quick. Uh, no, not my dear friend of 10 years. Police officer John O'Keefe is, is, is on the front lawn of this house. We don't know his condition. Hurry, get here quick. Hi, 911. Yeah, there's a man pass out in the snow. And I think she even said 32 Fairview. I think she didn't give the correct address. It wasn't Carrie's car. Thank you, Suzanne. So the Commonwealth wants to admit the 911 call made by Jennifer McCabe on January 29th, 2022, immediately following the discovery of John O'Keefe. In this call, the defendant, Karen Reed, can be heard yelling and making statements. We heard a recording of a, the call. I mean, I don't know what statements she allegedly made that are going to be heard in this 911 call. Does anybody know? Then she said his age, Chrissy says. There's a man passed out in the snow. And then she said how old she was. And then she made two calls to her sister, Coco, or Nick Nicole, who was in the house, two answered phone calls. And didn't she make more than one 911 call and one was, uh, was deleted from her call history? Jennifer said she also told 911 she guessed he'd been there in about an hour instead of saying, I have no idea, which is interesting. I can't wait to hear this 911 call. I think that... Um, but weren't there more, wasn't there more, was there more than one 911 call? Katie says, then that right there shows that she couldn't have done it. This is absolutely insane. Kimberly McGuire says, I want John's voicemail 912 call in evidence. 911 call. 91, yeah, I think you're saying. Um, Estrella, would those statements on the call be excited utterances? Yes, they could also be statements against interest. Just realized I was off camera the entire time. Was my audio off too? Or could you hear me? Tell me if I have to repeat everything I just said when I didn't want to talk on the screen. <laughs> Could you hear me? Oh, we could hear you. Oh, good. Thank you. Good to know. Good to know. All right, cool. Um, thank you, Emmy. Um, so I have questions. Okay. Um, and then they say an extrajudicial statement made by a party opponent is an exception to the rule against the introduction of hearsay and is it admissible? Although often referred to as the rule on admissions by a party. It encompasses any extrajudicial statements made by a party opponent, regardless whether it's inculpatory or against the party's interest. Sometimes it's also called an excited utterance. Um, they say the defendant's statements on the 911 call are non-testimonial. And then they cite a case that says in addressing 911 calls in particular, the U.S. Supreme Court noted that a 911 call and at least the initial interrogation conducted in connection with a 911 call is ordinarily not designed primarily to establish or prove some past fact, but to describe current circumstances work requiring police assistance. Yeah. That's also heard on that one that we've heard. I need help out here, which we have to assume she was saying to her sister inside the house. And yet they say they were sleeping and that's why they never came out. And that when they finally did come out, everybody was gone.
wicked psyched. If I'm not mistaken, 911 calls made from a cell phone. Go to state dispatch, then get rooted to town. Maybe that's what it sounded like, two calls. Maybe it sounded like that. Miku, honey, no. Don't worry about it. Don't worry, silly girl. You're a student. Um, the defendant's 911 statements are non-testimonial. And they say that when viewed objectively, the nature of a 911 call are statements which are elicited and necessary to be able to resolve the present emergency rather than simply to learn what happened in the past. The 911 call was recorded and preserved. And this was interesting too. The Commonwealth seeks to authenticate the call through Mrs. Jennifer McCabe. When have they ever called her Mrs. Jennifer McCabe? as well as this dispatcher and play it for the jury at trial. Okay, so you need to authenticate evidence in order to have it admitted. So you have to have somebody, you have to call somebody to the stand who can say, yeah, that's me on 911. That was me making that call. And then they're going to call the dispatcher too and say, yep, that was me on the other end of that call. Yeah. Interesting. Um, next, this is called the motion. All right, there we go. Continuous, continuous scroll is the only way to go on these documents. Commonwealth's motion in limine for notice and voir dire of a Bowdoin defense. Suzanne, please read my super chat. Okay, thanks. Suzanne says, thanks again for the super chat. This was an orchestrated call. All 911 operators tell the caller to check for signs of life and they provide CPR instructions. Interesting. Lisa, thank you for your super sticker. And Wicked Psych, thank you. Your time spent reviewing these documents is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for the contribution. Hi, Melissa, and thank you for your $10 super chat. If witnesses can't attend trial until they testify, won't it be televised every day? Yes, but they're not supposed to watch it. They're not supposed to watch it. And I would submit to you that even after they testify, they should not be allowed to sit in the courtroom because then they could listen to other testimony and then relate to other witnesses that were going to testify what's been said. They're not supposed to watch the coverage. And they are instructed not to watch the coverage by the court. Love you're covering this case. You're the only one my husband watches when I stream on the big TV. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Melissa's husband, for letting her watch me on the big TV. I appreciate that. Scott McGinnis says, Canton PD did not recuse themselves. That is a DA Marcy lie. Mass State Police DA Detective Group automatically took over the case upon J.O.'s death, no matter what lies. Yeah, but you know what, Scott? We went over this timeline, too. I know you're on that stream because you're religiously here. Um, they got a call to take over jurisdiction before Officer O'Keefe was pronounced. So that is curious. Were they calling in the friendly or I mean, how did they know they weren't going to be able to res re resuscitate him in the hospital? He still had breath sounds, remember? Um, so I'm not saying they recused themselves either, but yeah, I, he may have uh, not been 100% accurate on that, but things that make you say, hmm. What? Is a Bowdoin motion, you say? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm just going to pull up an article here and just read a little portion of it to you so that you have an idea of what a Bowdoin motion is. And this is from the Columbia Law School Law Review or some such. It's a paper. And the title of it is When Police Mess Up the Lack of Defense to Inadequate Police Investigations. So a Bowdoin defense is when you say the police investigation was so bad that I can't possibly be guilty. Um, and I think clearly that is going to be part of the defense here. 
I mean, obviously, any indication that there may have been sloppy investigation, a shoddy investigation, a misinvestigation, or a lack of an investigation, or a lack of a proper investigation would go to reasonable doubt, right? So, um, obviously, the Commonwealth wants to make a motion about this because they don't want that to be allowed. And here's what they say about that. Commonwealth respectfully requests that the defendant intends to offer a Bowdoin defense, the court conduct a voir dire hearing to determine whether the probative value of the Bowdoin evidence is not substantially outweighed by the risk of unfair prejudice to the Commonwealth. So there is a difference between a third party culprit defense where you're blaming somebody else for having committed the crime that you're accused of and the Bowdoin defense where you are blaming a sloppy investigation. And they can be used in conjunction with each other. But the Commonwealth says defendants have the right to base their defense on the failure of police adequately to investigate a murder in order to raise the issue of reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt in the minds of the jury. If known to law enforcement, a failure to investigate leads concerning another suspect is sufficient grounds for a Bowdoin defense. Information regarding a third party culprit whose existence was known to police, but whose involvement was never investigated, may be sufficient to raise a Bowdoin defense, even though the evidence may not otherwise be admissible as a third party culprit defense. It sounds like they're getting nervous about the theory of the defense. While often confused with each other, third-party culprit and Bowdoin defenses are logically and legally different. Oh, I just said that. Evidence admitted pursuant to a Bowdoin defense is not hearsay because it's not offered to show the truth of the matter asserted. If the defendant intends to offer evidence that police knew of an alternative suspect and failed to take reasonable steps to investigate, the information may be admitted simply to show the, that information was provided to police and not adequately investigated. However, this does not mean that defense counsel may always be able to admit third-party culprit evidence as part of a Bowdoin defense, even when it would otherwise not be admissible under a third-party culprit defense. Is your head spinning yet? However, In contrast to the third-party culprit defense, where evidence may be admitted regardless of whether the police knew of the suspect, third-party culprit information is admissible under a Bowdoin defense only if the police had learned of it during the investigation and failed reasonably to act on the information. Further, a defendant does not have an unfettered right to elicit evidence regarding the adequacy of the police investigation. The admissibility of such evidence hinges first and foremost on its relevance. Relevant evidence means any evidence having any tendency to make a consequential fact more or less probable and provide a link in the chain of proof. The Bowdoin defense is a two-edged sword for the defendant because it opens the door for the Commonwealth to offer evidence explaining why the police did not follow the line of investigation suggested by the defense and detail what investigative steps were taken. Oh, well, that's great. I would love to see that stuff. The more wide-ranging the defendant's attack on the police investigation, the broader the Commonwealth's response may be. If the defendant intends to offer Bowdoin evidence, this court should conduct a voir dire hearing to determine whether the evidence proffered by the defendant has the probative weight to exceed the risk of unfair prejudice to the Commonwealth and would not confuse the jury by diverting their attention to collateral matters. Okay, dude, they're entitled to a defense. Don't cry about it. Baseless claims or relying on the word on the street carries no indicia of reliability by itself. And when defense counsel fails to bolster unreliable statements by showing, for example, that the information came from a percipient witness, a Bowdoin defense should be excluded. Do you, okay, I'm breaking for a second. Do you think that Alan Jackson and David Unetti are just going to say, you know, word on the street had it, 
that rumors said that you think they don't have witnesses to back up what they're going to what their defense is going to be is that what you think <laughs> yeah madam ross don't cry about it freeloader says hmm, they knew everything and don't you think the defense has witnesses that are going to testify to that you think they're just walking in there uh, blind the defense i'm going to say this louder for people in the back the defense does not have to prove anything they do not have to prove anything. The burden of proof is on the Commonwealth. We are outraged. But I bet that if they're going to introduce this boat in evidence, they're going to have some witnesses to back it up. Yes, I'm just saying. Hold on, let me get that. You're moving quickly again. I slowed it down. Bring it on. Would love to hear the reasoning for their poor investigation. Me too. Estrella says, I have no doubt the judge will limit what the defense can say. Defense, this is freeloader says, the CW keeps acting like they're doing the Commonwealth a favor, doing the defense a favor. Right. Unlike the Commonwealth, defense doesn't need you. Buzzing for truth. Chloe remodeled cellar, sold the house, hid who was in the house, deleted phone calls. Right. All of that is proven. That's not word on the street. That's the street. That she wouldn't recuse herself. They don't want the... Um, Jury confused by having the defense divert their attention to collateral matters. Likewise, if the defendant intends to claim that police lost or destroyed evidence, she bears the initial burden to establish a reasonable possibility based on concrete evidence rather than a fertile imagination that access to the evidence would have produced evidence favorable to his or her cause. Hmm. Okay. So if John O'Keefe's clothing was not logged into evidence for weeks after the accident, the incident, the date of death, the murder, she has to prove that had it been logged in timely and properly, that the evidence would have been favorable to her. How about Outraged, outraged. I know I get a little, get a little feisty, a little passionate. Also, I'm a little, oh, it's two and a half hours. So we're not here for that long. Some people do eight, nine hours at a time, Brandy Churchwell. <laughs> if the court finds that the defendant has made a sufficient showing and allows the defendant to pursue a boat in defense, the Commonwealth intends to introduce a substantial amount of evidence that police adequately investigated the crimes and continue to investigate to debunk a variety of defendants' speculative and unreliable claims. For the foregoing reasons, please, 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 judge. We want notice of any boat in defense and voir dire to determine whether defendant's proffer is sufficient before any argument is made to the jury. Another thing that the Commonwealth wants to do is they want to exclude any reference to any pending internal affairs investigation or unfounded allegations of misconduct. Commonwealth is moving to prohibit disclosure or reference to any internal affairs investigations pending against any law enforcement witnesses. They don't say it, but they're referring to Michael Proctor. Also, they, uh, it says internal affairs investigations are confidential and disclosure of any investigations that have not resulted in a sustained finding of misconduct would serve no purpose other than to risk materially prejudicing the proceedings or confuse the jury. Oh, so is that why they didn't reach their findings yet? Because they don't want that to be admissible at the trial. Is that why he's still on full duty and he's still getting cases? Hmm. Hmm. Also, he's a major player in the Brian Walsh case, so they need him there too. So, I mean, 
Moreover, the Commonwealth moves to prohibit reference to any civil lawsuits fi filed against Canton Police Sergeant Lank that relate to an incident that occurred nearly 20 years ago. In the federal lawsuit previously relied on by the defendant, there were no adverse credibility determinations against Sergeant Lank or any fi findings of liability. The case was dismissed by agreement of the parties. I'm going to say <laughs> that that is a complete and utter false choice of words. The case was settled by agreement of the parties. They did not dismiss the case. A, dis a case can only be dismissed by a judge. Okay, so you don't agree to dismiss a case. You settle a case and then you agree to discontinue the case once the check clears in a civil action. The only way a civil action is dismissed is by a judge or a jury who finds the defendant not liable. So that case was apparently settled which could indicate that the Canton PD felt that they had some sort of liability because you don't settle cases that you don't think you have huge exposure in. I don't know, call me crazy. I've only been doing this for 30 years. Then they go on to say, if a police officer's credibility is a critical issue at the trial, the judge has the discretion in the interest of justice to admit evidence of specific instances of the officer's false statement in prior unrelated matters. A judge, in deciding whether to allow a police officer witness in the interest of justice to be impeached with prior misconduct, may consider the age of the prior misconduct, the strength of the evidence of the misconduct and the simplicity of establishing it and whether the prior misconduct is probative of how the officer conducts police investigations. In instances where there have been no sustained findings of misconduct, the jury should not be permitted to consider any allegations of misconduct. Whereas disciplinary action is but one possible outcome, exoneration and protection of the officer and the department from unwarranted criticism is another. Chef's kiss. They do not want the Canton PD to have any unwarranted criticism from a case that settled 20 years ago because of some, maybe, I don't know, a civil lawsuit against the Canton PD that maybe they paid out a lot of money on. I don't know. You guys can tell me. Did that have to do with that fight? How much did that case settle for 20 years ago? And what's the present value of that money today? The city paid them. Further, the Commonwealth requests advance notice and production of any reciprocal discovery related to any specific instances of prior misconduct or false statements that the defendant seeks to introduce or use to impeach any law enforcement witnesses. <laughs> you know, it can be used to impeach him. Is any prior deposition testimony that he gave 20 years ago in that civil case, if they took his deposition, I've seen attorneys walk in waving de deposition transcripts around from more than 20 years ago to try and impeach somebody's testimony because that is testimony under oath and it can be used to impeach you in any other proceeding in which you testify under oath. This is interesting to me too. This is a, a motion in limine by the Commonwealth for advanced notice if defendant intends to cross-examine any witness about alleged bias and a request for a pretrial ruling on whether the proposed evidence demonstrates a plausible showing of alleged bias, but they don't name any witnesses in here. Who do you think that they are referring to? What witnesses do you think that they're referring to? Let's say you. Commonwealth moves in limine for notice of whether the defendant intends to cross-examine any witness for bias and prejudice and what the defendant's plausible showing 
of alleged bias may be. Proctor, Lank, people are saying. Grasping at it. OMG. All of them. Proctor, the Emmy. Yeah. Proctor, Lank. Pat says, call me crazy, but I don't think Karen is the type of person to get in bar fights. The Alberts on the other hand. No, I mean, this, I think this case from 20 years ago, did this have, is this the case about with the Lapolito brothers and, or is that a different thing that I'm thinking of? Was this like a, um, this 20 years ago case against the Canton PD? Who knows? Somebody knows. I know somebody knows. Yes, that's the one about the Lapolito brothers were involved in this. And there was a bar fight and then then they sued the Canton PD. Boxer Brief Lank, only one in the BA's house directly involved him when wrongfully arrested two brothers for CA and they sued and got settlement. Imagine what this case is going to do, trampling over Karen Reed's rights defense. Huh. Interesting. Anybody know how much that settlement was? Chris Albert called in Lank, right? Called in the friendly, had him come to the bar, right? Arrest the guys and want a big chunk of change. I just don't know how much they won because look, 20 years ago, million dollars is like how many millions of dollars now? 200 K? Right. It was the Lapolitos. Okay. Look. I'm paying attention, right? I'm paying attention, you guys. 200K. All right. Oh, the response for unsealing the globe? I don't know. Did anybody send me that? I have to look. All right. So this is about bias, blah, 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 blah. I think um, that is everything on this presentation. So now we have to move to a different screen. To find Levy's letter. You girls got too many tabs open over here, over here. Let me know if there's any other things you want to go over because we've been here for two and a half hours already. Let me see. I don't know why I can't get this to go down. Kamala has already released the motion to dismiss for Fox News for Ted Daniel. He received 50 pages today that he's going to review. Oh, if I had that today, I could review it too. Oh, well, I can't wait to hear what it is. But wait, while we're here, so they already released it? Oh, this is going to be a problem for them because here's a... Um, here is a letter from Josh Levy of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let's take a look at that. Okay. And this is a letter dated today. It was filed in court <clears throat> today at 3.30 p.m. via email and overnight delivery. Dear Judge Canoni, in light of the hearing held yesterday on the motion of Boston Globe Media Partners to terminate or modify impoundment orders in the above referenced matter, I write on behalf of the United States to make three points. First, the U.S. believes the court in analyzing these issues would benefit greatly from reviewing the order 
entered in the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts on February 20th of 2024, the protective order. As the court is aware, the protective order governs disclosure of materials produced by the U.S. Attorney's Office in response to the party's January 18th, 2024, joint request under the Department of Justice's TUI regulations, the confidential materials. The protective order explains, among other things, the reasons that sealing of the materials is required and how the parties may use the confidential materials at the upcoming trial. Indeed, it may be the case that some of the confidential materials may be disclosed at the trial in a matter that is entirely consistent with the protective order. While the United States understands that the court has not yet received a copy of the protective order from the parties, we understand that one of the parties will be filing the protective order with the court today. To the extent the court does not receive a copy, the U.S. suggests that the court order one or both of the parties to file it under seal as soon as possible. Second, with respect to two of the memoranda that are the subject of the motion and the court's oral ruling, on April 9th, seeking to unseal those filings in some form, specifically docket numbers 228 and 232, the U.S. respectfully requests that the court permit the U.S. to review those filings in unredacted form before the court reaches a final determination on unsealing so that the United States can assess whether disclosure is consistent with the protective order or whether the United States would seek modification of the protective order to permit further disclosure. The parties have not provided the United States with copies of the filings given your honor's impoundment order. While the parties have notified the United States of the Bates number of the confidential materials referenced in the filings as required by the protective order, the Bates numbers do not provide the United States with enough context to, ac to assess whether disclosure is appropriate. Finally, given that the federal court's protective order sets forth strict parameters for dissemination of the confidential materials, and non-compliance with that order affects a federal interest. It's like we're watching you. The United States is obligated to ensure compliance with the protective order. Should the court authorize the unsealing of the filings contained in confidential materials in a matter that is inconsistent with the protective order in its current form, the U.S. may need to take appropriate action to ensure that the federal court order and its interests are adequately enforced, which could include removal to federal court of any adverse ruling pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1442. To be sure, the United States has no interest in that course of action, particularly over an ancillary motion that has not seemed to affect the party's ability to try this case on the court's schedule. XOXO, very truly yours, Mary Moraine. You, uh, Deputy U.S. Attorney, who apparently works under acting U.S. Attorney, Joshua Levy. He's basically like, um, did I really watch on YouTube that you said during the hearing yesterday that you're just going to disregard the court order and you have authority that you trump federal court and that you can basically do whatever you want? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, no, you can't. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you didn't. It's like a warning. Warning, warning. I don't know. So, um, yeah, the ADA, poor Ms. McLaughlin, kept trying to tell Antibab there were rules against releasing this info. Yes. Um, yeah, so in simple terms, that's what it means. He's like, um, you don't trump a federal order. We have a federal protective order. And guess what? Federal court trumps state court. <laughs> so uh, what makes you think that you can just disregard our protective order without even actually even asking to see it? Because if, you, if, if what you said is true and they just, she released some of that stuff today that may have been a violation of the protective order, then then she could be in violation of the protective order unless what she released had nothing to do with the federal investigation was only the state grand jury stuff. It's complicated, you guys. I can't give you, I can't give you a, an opinion on it without seeing what was actually released.
<laughs> John Monagle, really? Is that person a lawyer? <laughs> That's funny. She did say, I haven't seen the order. Somebody said she already saw the order. She's saying, no, I have not been provided with a copy of it, really? Um, because I think during like the discussion with all those letters and they had to enter into a protective order and she better be aware of what that protective order is because if she doesn't, that's, um, that's a little scary. Um, she needs to, am I crazy? Am I crazy? Sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder when, um, my goodness, my goodness, friends. Uh, let's see if there's anything else interesting in my email that anybody sent me. That was like, Are there any motions of the Commonwealth? I know there were like 31 of them and I did not do every single one. They have quite, you know, they did something on the the, voir juror, uh, the juror questionnaire. Oh, here's one that I did want to look at and I didn't have a copy of it. So thank you so much to the kind viewer who just sent this to me. They want to redact the cause of death from the death certificate. Uh, so thank you to Catherine very much for sending this to me. And this is document number 297, 247. There's so many documents in this case, you guys, that is getting crazy. All right. I have not looked at this yet, so we're going to look at this together. This is the Commonwealth's motion in Lemonade to preclude reference to redact the manner of death contained on the victim's death certificate because remember it says undetermined so let's take a look the commonwealth moves in limine in accordance with settled practice that the death certificate be redacted for the means and manner of death Citing two cases that say, we have stated that with respect to the admission of death certificates, the better practice is to redact the manner of death, such as the words homicide, suicide, or accident. Or undetermined or natural. There's five. <laughs> but, you know, see, that's... If the case law says such as homicide, suicide, or accident... Um, that should be redacted, but if it's undetermined or natural, should that not be redacted? I have questions. General law as amended provides that nothing contained in the record of a death which has reference to the question of liability for causing the death shall be admissible in evidence. In a criminal trial, excluding from the death certificate the words homicide, suicide, accident, or in this case, undetermined, is the better and safer course. See Commonwealth v. Ellis. I haven't looked at that case, so I don't know if that is exactly what it says or if that is what the Commonwealth word salad says. Where the defendant does not dispute the validity of the death certificate or the fact that John O'Keefe is dead, the question of liability is left solely to the, to the trial jury. For the above reasons, the Commonwealth asked this court to preclude any reference to and redact the manner of death contained in the victim's death certificate. Do you know what I want to see? And tell me if any of you have it. Got a full screen for this because this is important. Is there a police report for the motor vehicle accident where Karen hit John with her car? In New York, it is required in a motor vehicle accident that an MV-104 form is filed with the state. Anytime there is a motor vehicle accident resulting in personal injury or death or property damage, is there a police report specific to the motor vehicle accident? Does anybody know?
Rich says, no, there is not. Lauren says, probably not. Crash report, is that what you call it in Massachusetts? Is there one? You know, if you've ever been involved in a car accident, you have to get the police report. You have to give it to your insurance company. Then your insurance company fights it out with someone else's insurance company to fix your car. No. Or if you want to sue for personal injury, you have to have a police report to show that the accident happened. Nope. Never. It was never filed. Hmm. Absence of evidence. John says, so they think if they allow a death certificate that says the cause of death is undetermined, then the defense can say the cause of death is undetermined. Yeah. Where's the police report for the car accident, folks? No, there's no re police report, says Suzanne, says Tammy. That'd be my opening. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that no police report was ever filed for this motor vehicle accident because the evidence will show this was not a motor vehicle accident. Officer John O'Keefe was not hit by a car and a car did not hit Officer John O'Keefe, period, full stop. Thank you. And sit down. Like, really? Great question. No. What about our insurance company? Was there an insurance payout with regard to this case? Does anybody know? Can anybody verify whether or not her auto insurance company paid a settlement for the wrongful death? No insurance payout. Liz said no, no suit filed. $346,000. I don't know. That could have been, is that a settlement? Like a, like her carrier paid 300 or was this, um, was that like life insurance or his pension? I mean, they may have been like there. I've looked at the estate file. So I know kind of what was going on with the estate. Somebody says 1.3 million. I don't know that her carrier would have paid out. There's not even a police report. There's no civil suit that's been filed that I could find. I don't think, listen, insurance companies do not want to pay. Anybody who's ever been in an accident or been a plaintiff in a lawsuit knows that they do not want to pay. They will do anything they can not to pay. Wouldn't civil suits happen after the criminal trial? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but there's been no proof of a car accident because there's not even a car accident report. There's no police report. Oh, that was a GoFundMe? Okay, so that you're saying that was a payout in the GoFundMe? I didn't find a lawsuit. They won't pay until this is done. No, he's talking about the Oh, the town suit with Lank for the 346000 I don't know. Chat's moving fast, but um, police report. I don't even think they have an accident reconstruction theory. I think they do have an accident reconstruction as who works uh, at MSP. John says, I think that the insurance company would fight this claim with good reason in this case. Yeah. Anybody here an insurance adjuster? You ever work for an insurance company? You ever? Uh, I litigated... A lot of civil litigation in my time, and carriers do not want to pay. So I had heard, you know, word on the street. Word on the street was that there was some sort of insurance settlement with her car, but I mean, with her carrier, but I have not been able to verify that. And as you know, I am document based, I am fact based, and I am procedure based, and I like to deal with what's in actual court documents. So I, I this was just a question I had while I was reading this over. It just struck me that. Why is there no motor vehicle accident police report? I don't know. Oh, Mozzie, thank you so much for your super chat. Just to acknowledge your grace, compassion, and composure while dealing with all the stuff you present on this channel. I appreciate all your work and hate that YouTube steals 30% of my to support you. Oh, you're sweet. You're very sweet. Thanks, Julie, for becoming a member. Thanks, Erica, for becoming a member. Thanks, Lisa, for your super chat. Melanie, you are a rock star. Thank you. 
Scott says, thank you, Scott. Uh, original death certificate cause of death unknown. I thought, yeah, undetermined, I thought, right? Undetermined. There's five options for that box and they are homicide, suicide, accident, natural, or undetermined. Hmm. Uncle Fredo says no. 346K is what it was settled for. I don't know. I'm going to have to go through the chat later. State does not have a reconstruction report. Thank you, Amy. As always, thank you for covering this. Hello from Norfolk County. Hello, Norfolk. Hello, Norfolk. Yeah, the SUV does. I mean, the SUV definitely has insurance. I mean, aren't you required to have car insurance in Massachusetts? I know that some states you're not required to. Like, I think like New Hampshire, you're not required to. But in New York, you can't even register your car unless you have proof of insurance. Like, it's no joke here. Candy Kane, hello. Has worked inside claims and subrogation, right? Would you pay out on this case? Probably not. Car accident. You need an accident report for that, right? Trump chick says they have a theory. That's why they want the jury to see the curve in the road backing up out of question. Trish Norman says an adjuster would have been sent out or a claim filed digitally with pictures. Yeah, we wouldn't have access to that though, right? Jennifer, so his whole family strongly believes that she did it, but there's no civil case, no insurance payout. That, I don't know. I don't know. I know that his brother was appointed to be the executor of his estate of John's estate. So he's in charge of whatever's in the estate on behalf of, I'm not sure what his will said or who his assets, his house, did he own his home? I mean, there's stuff in the estate. Who got that stuff? I don't know. David Dinetti said he couldn't even get a police report out of the arraignment. A police report, like a motor vehicle police report. Like there was a police report of the Canton PD investigation and what they did at the scene. But uh, they did not, as far as I know, have a car accident report. The special, Suzanne says nothing was filed in auto claim. I don't know. Insurance is mandatory in Massachusetts. Only state no insurance needed is Rhode Island, is it? I thought New Hampshire was like that too. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And Karen's still paying for her car, huh? My goodness. All right. Uh, listen, you guys, we got to get my moderators a break. We've been in here for almost three hours. So thank you so much to my moderators for keeping the chat classy. And you guys are awesome. Amazing, amazing work. If everybody would ever so kindly just hit the hit the like button on your way out because it helps this stream and hit the subscribe button. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It just helps the channel. And, uh, you know, comment. Come for me in the comments. Just be respectful. I respect everyone's opinion. I really, really do. Um, I hate that people are going at each other so horrifically on other platforms and even on this platform just because people have a difference of opinion about what happened that night. Just because we have differences of opinion uh, doesn't mean that um, we need to hate each other or kill each other. It's just what's going on is just... Ugh, it's ugh. But in any event, as I always say, be cool, be kind, be classy, because you know what? It's really not hard. Like it is really, really, really so not hard. Peace out. Probably have more stuff for you tomorrow because this stuff is going to be heard on Friday. So let me get my voice back and then I'll see you later. Good night, everybody.